Section 12 of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Socrates. Concluded. It must not be imagined that anywhere in the recorded conversations of Socrates can we find thus in so many words expounded his fundamental doctrine. Socrates was not an expositor but a questioner. He disclaimed the position of a teacher. He refused to admit that any were his pupils or disciples. But his questioning had two sides, each in its way leading people on to an apprehension of the ideal in existence. The first side may be called the negative or destructive, the second the positive or constructive. In the first, whose object was to break down all formalism, all mere regard for rules or traditions or unreasoned maxims, his method had considerable resemblance to that of the sophists. Like them, he descended not infrequently to what looked very like quibbling and wordplay. As Aristotle observes, the dialectic method differed from that of the sophists, not so much in its form as in the purpose for which it was employed. The end of the sophists was to confuse. The end of Socrates was through confusion to reach a more real, because a more reasoned certainty. The sophists sought to leave the impression that there was no such thing as truth. He wished to lead people to the conviction that there was a far deeper truth than they were as yet possessed of. A specimen of his manner of conversation preserved for us by Xenophon, Memorabilia 4, 2, will make the difference clearer. Euthydemus was a young man who had shown great industry in forming a collection of wise sayings from poets and others, and who prided himself on his superior wisdom because of his knowledge of these. Socrates skilfully manages to get the ear of this young man by commending him for his collection, and asks him what he expects his learning to help him to become. A physician? No, Euthydemus answers. An architect? No. And so in like manner with other practical skills. The geometricians, astronomers, professional reciters. None of these he discovers is what Euthydemus aims at. He hopes to become a great politician and statesman. Then, of course, he hopes to be a just man himself. Euthydemus flatters himself he is that already. But, says Socrates, there must be certain acts which are the proper products of justice, as of other functions or skills. No doubt. Then, of course, you can tell us what those acts or products are. Of course I can, and the products of injustice as well. Very good. Then suppose we write down in two opposite columns what acts are products of justice and what of injustice. I agree, says Euthydemus. Well, now, what of falsehood? In which column shall we put it? Why, of course, in the unjust column. And cheating? In the same column. And stealing? In it too. And enslaving? Yes. Not one of these can go to the just column? Why, that would be an unheard of thing. Well, but, says Socrates, suppose a general has to deal with some enemy of his country that has done it great wrong. If he conquer and enslave this enemy, is that wrong? Certainly not. If he carries off the enemy's goods or cheats him in his strategy, what about these acts? Oh, of course, they are quite right. But I thought you were talking about deceiving or ill-treating friends. Then in some cases we shall have to put these very same acts in both columns. I suppose so. Well now, suppose we confine ourselves to friends. Imagine a general with an army under him, discouraged and disorganized. Suppose he tells them that reserves are coming up, and by cheating them into this belief he saves them from their discouragement and enables them to win a victory. What about this cheating of one's friends? Why, I suppose we shall have to put this, too, on the just side. Or suppose a lad needs medicine but refuses to take it, and his father cheats him into the belief that it is something nice, and getting him to take it saves his life. What about that cheat? That will have to go to the just side, too. Or suppose you find a friend in a desperate frenzy and steal his sword from him for fear that he should kill himself. What do you say to that theft? That will have to go there, too. But I thought you said there must be no cheating of friends. Well, I must take it all back, if you please. Very good. But now there is another point I should like to ask you. Whether do you think the man more unjust who is a voluntary violator of justice, or he who is an involuntary violator of it? Upon my word, Socrates, I no longer have any confidence in my answers. For the whole thing has turned out to be exactly the contrary of what I previously imagined. However, suppose I say that the voluntary deceiver is the more unjust. Do you consider that justice is a matter of knowledge just as much, say, as writing? 
yes i do well now which do you consider the better skilled as a writer the man who makes a mistake in writing or in reading what is written because he chooses to do so or the man who does so because he can't help it oh the first because he can put it right whenever he likes very well if a man in the same way breaks the rule of right knowing what he is doing while another breaks the same rule because he can't help it which by analogy must be the better versed in justice the first i suppose and the man who is better versed in justice must be the juster man apparently so but really socrates i don't know where i am i have been flattering myself that i was in possession of a philosophy which could make a good and able man of me but how great think you must now be my disappointment when i find myself unable to answer the simplest question on the subject many other questions are put to him tending to probe his self-knowledge and in the end he is brought to the conclusion that perhaps he had better hold his tongue for it seems he knows nothing at all and so he went away deeply despondent despising himself as an absolute dolt now many adds xenophon when brought into this condition by socrates never came near him again but euthydemus concluded that his only hope of ever being worth anything was in seeing as much of socrates as he could and so he never quitted his side as long as he had a chance but tried to follow his mode of living and socrates when he perceived this to be his temper no longer tormented him but sought with all simplicity and clearness to show him what he deemed it best for him to do and think was this cross-examination mere tormenting with a purpose or can we discover underlying it any hint of what socrates deemed to be the truth about justice let us note that throughout he is in search of a definition but that as soon as any attempt is made to define or classify any particular type of action as just or unjust special circumstances are suggested which overturn the classification let us note further that while the immediate result is apparently only to confuse the remoter but more permanent result is to raise a suspicion of any hard and fast definitions and to suggest that there is something deeper in life than language is adequate to express a law in the members a living principle for good which transcends forms and maxims and which alone gives real value to acts note further the suggestion that this living principle has a character analogous to the knowledge or skill of an accomplished artificer it has relation on the one hand to law as a principle binding on the individual it has relation on the other hand to utility as expressing itself not in words but in acts beneficial to those concerned hence the socratic formula justice is equivalent to the lawful on the one hand to the useful on the other socrates had thus solved by anticipation the apparently never-ending controversy about morality is it a matter imposed by god upon the heart and conscience of each individual is it dictated by the general sense of the community is it the product of utility the socratic answer would be that it is all three and that all three mean ultimately the same thing what god prescribes is what man when he is truly man desires and what god prescribes and man desires is that which is good and useful for man it is not a matter for verbal definition but for vital realization the true morality is that which works the ideally desirable is ultimately the only possible course of action for all violations of it are ultimately suicidal note finally the suggestion that the man who knows in socrates sense of knowledge what is right shows only more fully his righteousness when he voluntarily sins it is the unwilling sinner who is the wrongdoer when we consider this strange doctrine in relation to the instances given the general with his army the father with his son the prudent friend with his friend in desperate straits we see that what is meant is that sin in the real sense is not to be measured or defined by conformity or otherwise to some formal standard at least in the case of those who know that is in the case of men who have realized goodness in its true nature in their characters and lives as st paul expressed it romans thirteen ten, love is the fulfilling of the law or again galatians five twenty three. after enumerating the fruits of the spirit love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance he adds against such there is no law in the domain of life not less than in that of the arts the highest activity does not always or necessarily take the form of conformity to rule there are critical moments when rules fail when in fact obedience to rule would mean disobedience to that higher law of which rules and formulae are at best only an adumbration 
the originality of the great musician or painter consists in just such transcendence of accepted formulae that is why he invariably encounters opposition and obloquy from the learned conventional pedants of his time and in the domain of morals the martyrs reformers prophets are in like manner willing sinners they are denounced persecuted crucified for are they not disturbers of society do they not unsettle young men do they not come as christ came not to bring peace into the world but a sword and thus it is that the willing sinners of one generation are the martyrs and heroes of the next through their life and death a richer meaning has been given to the law of beauty or of rectitude only alas in its turn to be translated into new conventions new formulae which shall in due time require new martyrs to transcend them and thus on the other hand the perfectly honest sticklers for the old and commonplace unwilling sinners all unconscious of their sin are fated to bear in history the brand of men who have persecuted the righteous without cause to each according to the strange sad law of life time brings its revenges end of section twelve section thirteen of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the incomplete socratics one aristippus and the cyrenaics aristippus was a native of cyrene a greek colony on the north coast of africa he is said to have come to athens because of his desire to hear socrates but from the notices of him which we find in xenophon's memoirs he appears to have been from the first a somewhat intractable follower dissenting especially from the poverty and self-denial of the master's mode of life he in course of time founded a school of his own called the cyrenaic from his own place of birth and from the fact that many subsequent leaders of the school also belonged to cyrene among his notable disciples were his daughter arete her son named aristippus after his grandfather ptolemaeus the ethiopian antipater of cyrene and a long succession of others aristippus was a man of considerable subtlety of mind a ready speaker clever in adapting himself to persons and circumstances on one occasion being asked what benefit he considered philosophy had conferred upon him he answered the capacity of associating with everyone without embarrassment philosophy in fact was to aristippus a method of social culture a means of making the best of life as he found it as horace observes of him epistles one seventeen twenty three omnis aristippum decuit color et status et res tentantem majora feri praesentibus aequum every aspect and manner of life and fortune fitted aristippus he aimed at what was greater yet kept an even mind whatever his present condition as we have already said this school was incompletely socratic inasmuch as philosophy was not an end in itself knowledge whether of oneself or of other matters had no intrinsic interest for them philosophy was only a means towards pleasurable living enabling them so to analyze and classify the several experiences of life as to render a theory of satisfactory existence possible with them first came into prominence a phrase which held a large place in all subsequent greek philosophy the end of existence by which was meant that which summed up the good in existence that which made life worth living that which was good and desirable in and for itself and not merely as a means to something else what then according to the cyrenaics was the end of life their answer was that life had at each moment its own end in the pleasure of that moment the past was gone the future not yet with us remembrance of the one fear or hope of the other might contribute to affect the purity of the present pleasure but such as it was the present pleasure was a thing apart complete in and for itself nor was its perfection qualified by any question of the means by which it was procured the moment's pleasure was pleasurable whatever men might say as to the manner of its procuring this pleasure was a tranquil activity of the being like the gently heaving sea midway between violent motion which was pain and absolute calm which was insensibility as a state of activity it was something positive not a mere release from pain not a simple filling up of a vacuum nothing was in its essential nature either just or noble or base custom and convention pronounced them one or other the wise man made the best he could of his conditions valuing mental activity and friendship and wealth and bodily exercise and avoiding envy and excessive indulgence of passion and superstition not because the first were in themselves good or the second evil but because they were respectively helpers or hinderers of pleasure he is the master and possessor of pleasure not who abstains from it but who uses it and keeps his self-command in the using moderate indulgence this is wisdom 
the one criterion whether of good or of truth is the feeling of the moment for the man who feels it all question of causes of feelings is delusive we can say with truth and certainty i have the sensation of white or the sensation of sweet but that there is a white or a sweet thing which is the cause of the sensation that we cannot say for certain a man may very well have the sensation white or sweet from something which has no such quality as men in delusion or madness have impressions that are true and real inasmuch as they have them although other people do not admit their reality there is therefore no criterion of truth as between man and man we may employ the same words but each has his own impressions and his own individual experiences one can easily understand this as the doctrine of such a man as aristippus the easy-going man of the world the courtier and the wit the favourite of the tyrant dionysus it fits in well enough with a life of genial self-indulgence it always reappears whenever a man has reconciled himself to roll with pleasure in a sensual sty but life is not always nor for most persons at any time a thing of ease and soft enchantments and the cyrenaic philosophy must remain for the general workaday world a stale exotic every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost is a maxim which comes as a rule only to the lips of the worldly successful while they think themselves strong enough to stand alone but this solitude of selfishness neither works nor lasts every man at some time becomes the hindmost if not before at least in the hour of death for him or his at that hour he is hardly disposed for himself or those he loves to repeat his maxim two antisthenes and the cynics aristippus in his praises of pleasure as the one good for man remarks that there were some who refused pleasure from perversity of mind taking pleasure so to speak in the denial of pleasure the school of the cynics made this perverse mood as aristippus deemed it the maxim of their philosophy as the cyrenaic school was the school of the rich the courtly the self-indulgent so the cynic was the school of the poor the exiles the ascetics each was an extreme expression of a phase of greek life and thought though there was this point of union between them that liberty of a kind was sought by both the cyrenaics claimed liberty to please themselves in the choice of their enjoyments the cynics sought liberty through denial of enjoyments both moreover were cosmopolitan they marked the decay of the greek patriotism which was essentially civic and the rise of the wider but less intense conception of humanity aristippus in a conversation with socrates xenophon memorabilia two one on the qualifications of those who are fitted to be magistrates disclaims all desire to hold such a position himself there is he says to my thinking a middle way neither of rule nor of slavery but of freedom which leads most surely to true happiness so to avoid all the evils of partisanship and faction i nowhere take upon me the position of a citizen but in every city remain a sojourner and a stranger and in like manner antisthenes the cynic being asked how man should approach politics answered he will approach it as he will fire not too near lest he be burnt not too far away lest he starve of cold and diogenes being asked of what city he was answered i am a citizen of the world the cynic ideal in fact was summed up in these four words wisdom independence free speech liberty antisthenes founder of the school was a native of athens but being of mixed blood his mother was a thracian he was not recognized as an athenian citizen he was a student first under gorgias and acquired from him a considerable elegance of literary style subsequently he became a devoted hearer of socrates and became prominent among his followers for an asceticism surpassing his masters one day we are told he showed a great rent in the threadbare cloak which was his only garment whereupon socrates slyly remarked i can see through your cloak your love of glory he carried a leathern scrip and a staff and the scrip and staff became distinctive marks of his school the name cynic derived from the greek word for a dog is variously accounted for some attributing it to the dog-like habits of the school others to their love of barking criticism others to the fact that a certain gymnasium in the outskirts of athens called sinosages sacred to hercules the patron divinity of men in the political position of antisthenes was a favourite resort of his he was a voluminous some thought a too voluminous expounder of his tenets like the other incomplete socratics his teaching was mainly on ethical questions his chief pupil and successor was the famous diogenes a native of sinope a greek colony on the euxine sea he even bettered the instructions of his master in the matter of extreme frugality of living 
claiming that he was a true follower of hercules in preferring independence to every other good the tale of his living in a cask or tub is well known his theory was that the peculiar privilege of the gods consisted in their need of nothing men approached nearest the life of the gods in needing as little as possible many other sayings of one or other teacher are quoted all tending to the same conclusion for example i had rather be mad than enjoying myself follow the pleasures that come after pains not those which bring pains in their train there are pains that are useless there are pains that are natural the wise choose the latter and thus find happiness even through pain for the very contempt of pleasure comes with practice to be the highest pleasure when i wish a treat says antisthenes i do not go and buy it at great cost in the marketplace i find my storehouse of pleasures in the soul the life of the wise man therefore was a training of mind and body to despise pleasure and attain independence in this way virtue was teachable and could be so acquired as to become an inseparable possession the man who had thus attained to wisdom not of words but of deeds was as it were in an impregnable fortress that could neither crumble into ruin nor be lost by treachery and so antisthenes being asked what was the most essential point of learning answered to unlearn what is evil that is to say to the cynic conception men were born with a root of evil in them in the love of pleasure the path of wisdom was a weaning of soul and body by practice from the allurements of pleasure until both were so perfectly accustomed to its denial as to find an unalloyed pleasure in the very act of refusing it in this way virtue became absolutely sufficient for happiness and so far was it from being necessary to have wealth or the admiration of men in addition that the true kingly life was to do well and be ill spoken of all else but virtue was a matter of indifference the cosmopolitan temper of these men led them to hold of small account the forms and prejudices of ordinary society they despised the rights of marriage they thought no flesh unclean they believed in no multifarious theology there was but one divinity the power that ruled all nature the one absolutely self-centered independent being whose manner of existence they sought to imitate nor had they any sympathy with the subtleties of verbal distinction cultivated by some of the socratics as by other philosophers or sophists of their time definitions and abstractions and classifications led to no good a man was a man what was good was good to say that a man was good did not establish the existence of some abstract class of goods as antisthenes once said to plato a horse i see but hoarseness i do not see what the exact point of this criticism was we may reserve for the present three euclides the megaric euclides a native of megara on the corinthian isthmus was a devoted hearer of socrates making his way to hear him sometimes even at the risk of his life in defiance of a decree of his native city forbidding intercourse with athens when plato and other athenian followers of socrates thought well to quit athens for a time after socrates execution they were kindly entertained by euclides at megara the exact character of the development which the socratic teaching received from euclides and his school is a matter of considerable doubt the allusions to the tenets of the school in plato and others are only fragmentary we gather however from them that euclides was wholly antithetical to the personal turn given to philosophy both by the cyrenaics and the cynics he revived and developed with much dialectical subtlety the metaphysical system of parmenides and the aleatics maintaining that there is but one absolute existence and that sense and sense perceptions as against this are nothing this one absolute existence was alone absolutely good and the good for man could only be found in such an absorption of himself in this one absolute good through reason and contemplation as would bring his spirit into perfectness of union with it such absorption raised a man above the troubles and pains of life and thus in insensibility to these through reason man attained his highest good the school is perhaps interesting only in so far as it marks the continued survival of the abstract dialectic method of earlier philosophy as such it had a very definite influence sometimes through agreement sometimes by controversy on the systems of plato and aristotle now to be dealt with end of section 13 section 14 of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 14 plato this great master the shakespeare of greek philosophy as one may call him for his fertility his variety his humour his imagination his poetic grace was born at athens in the year 429 bc he was of noble family 
numbering among his ancestors no less a man than the great lawgiver solon and tracing back his descent even further to the legendary codrus the last king of athens at a very early age he seems to have begun to study the philosophers heraclitus more particularly and before he was twenty he had written a tragedy about that time however he met socrates and at once giving up all thought of poetic fame he burned his poem and devoted himself to the hearing of socrates for ten years he was his constant companion when socrates met his death in 399 plato and other followers of the master fled at first to megara as already mentioned he then entered on a period of extended travel first to cyrene and egypt thence to italy and sicily in italy he devoted himself specially to a study of the doctrine of pythagoras it is said that at syracuse he offended the tyrant dionysus the elder by his freedom of speech and was delivered up to the spartans who were then at war with athens ultimately he was ransomed and found his way back to athens but he is said to have paid a second visit to sicily when the younger dionysus became tyrant he seems to have entertained the hope that he might so influence this young man as to be able to realize through him the dream of his life a government in accordance with the dictates of philosophy his dream however was disappointed of fruition and he returned to athens there in the groves of academus a mythic hero of athens to spend the rest of his days in converse with his followers and there at the ripe age of eighty one he died from the scene of his labours his philosophy has ever since been known as the academic philosophy unlike socrates he was not content to leave only a memory of himself and his conversations he was unwearied in the redaction and correction of his written dialogues altering them here and there both in expression and in structure it is impossible therefore to be absolutely certain as to the historical order of composition or publication among his numerous dialogues but a certain approximate order may be fixed we may take first a certain number of comparatively short dialogues which are strongly socratic in the following respects first they each seek a definition of some particular virtue or quality second each suggests some relation between it and knowledge third each leaves the answer somewhat open treating the matter suggestively rather than dogmatically these dialogues are comedies which treats of temperance mens sana in corpore sano lucis which treats of friendship laches of courage eon of poetic inspiration mino of the teachableness of virtue euthyphro of piety the last of these may be regarded as marking a transition to a second series which are concerned with the trial and death of socrates the euthyphro opens with an allusion by socrates to his approaching trial and in the apology we have a platonic version of socrates speech in his own defence in crito we have the story of his noble self-abnegation and civic obedience after his condemnation in phaedo we have his last conversation with his friends on the subject of immortality and the story of his death another series of the dialogues may be formed of those more or less satirical in which the ideas and methods of the sophists are criticized protagoras in which socrates suggests that all virtues are essentially one euthydemus in which the assumption and airs of some of the sophists are made fun of cratylus of the sophistic use of words gorgias of the true and the false the truly good and the truly evil hippias of voluntary and involuntary sin alcibiades of self-knowledge menexenus a possibly ironical set oration after the manner of the sophists in praise of athens the whole of this third series are characterized by humor dramatic interest variety of personal type among the speakers keenness rather than depth of philosophic insight there are many suggestions of profounder thoughts afterwards worked out more fully but on the whole these dialogues rather stimulate thought than satisfy it the great poet thinker is still playing with his tools a higher stage is reached in the symposium which deals at once humorously and profoundly with the subject of love human and divine and its relations to art and philosophy the whole consummated in a speech related by socrates as having been spoken to him by diotima a wise woman of mantinea from this speech an extract as translated by professor jowett may be quoted here it marks the transition point from the merely playful and critical to the relatively serious and dogmatic stage in the mind of plato marvel not she said if you believe that love is of the immortal as we have already several times acknowledged for here again and on the same principle too the mortal nature is seeking as far as is possible to be everlasting and immortal and this is only to be attained by generation because generation always leaves behind a new existence in the place of the old nay even in the life of the same individual there is succession and not absolute unity 
a man is called the same and yet in the short interval which elapses between youth and age and in which every animal is said to have life and identity he is undergoing a perpetual process of loss and reparation hair flesh bones blood and the whole body are always changing which is true not only of the body but also of the soul whose habits tempers opinions desires pleasures pains fears never remain the same in any one of us but are always coming and going and equally true of knowledge which is still more surprising for not only do the sciences in general come and go so that in respect of them we are never the same but each of them individually experiences a like change for what is implied in the word recollection but the departure of knowledge which is ever being forgotten and is renewed and preserved by recollection and appears to be the same although in reality new according to that law of succession by which all mortal things are preserved not absolutely the same but by substitution the old worn-out mortality leaving another new and similar existence behind unlike the divine which is always the same and not another and in this way socrates the mortal body or mortal anything partakes of immortality but the immortal in another way marvel not then at the love which all men have of their offspring for that universal love and interest is for the sake of immortality i was astonished at her words and said is this really true o thou wise diotima and she answered with all the authority of a sophist of that socrates you may be assured think only of the ambition of men and you will wonder at the senselessness of their ways unless you consider how they are stirred by the love of an immortality of fame they are ready to run risks greater far than they would have run for their children and to spend money and undergo any sort of toil and even to die for the sake of leaving behind them a name which shall be eternal do you imagine that alcestis would have died to save admetus or achilles to avenge patroclus or your own codrus in order to preserve the kingdom for his sons if they had not imagined that the memory of their virtues which is still retained among us would be immortal nay she said i am persuaded that all men do all things and the better they are the more they do them in hope of the glorious fame of immortal virtue for they desire the immortal they whose bodies only are creative betake themselves to women and beget children this is the character of their love their offspring as they hope will preserve their memory and give them the blessedness and immortality which they desire in the future but creative souls for there certainly are men who are more creative in their souls than in their bodies conceive that which is proper for the soul to conceive or retain and what are these conceptions wisdom and virtue in general and such creators are poets and all artists who are deserving of the name inventor but the greatest and fairest sort of wisdom by far is that which is concerned with the ordering of states and families and which is called temperance and justice and he who in youth has the seed of these implanted in him and is himself inspired when he comes to maturity desires to beget and generate he wanders about seeking beauty that he may beget offspring for in deformity he will beget nothing and naturally embraces the beautiful rather than the deformed body above all when he finds a fair and noble and well-nurtured soul he embraces the two in one person and to such an one he is full of speech about virtue and the nature and pursuits of a good man and he tries to educate him and at the touch of the beautiful which is ever present to his memory even when absent he brings forth that which he had conceived long before and in company with him tends that which he brings forth and they are married by a far nearer tie and have a closer friendship than those who beget mortal children for the children who are their common offspring are fairer and more immortal who when he thinks of homer and hesiod and other great poets would not rather have their children than ordinary human ones who would not emulate them in the creation of children such as theirs which have preserved their memory and given them everlasting glory or who would not have such children as lycurgus left behind him to be the saviors not only of lacedaemon but of hellas as one may say there is solon too who is the revered father of athenian laws and many others there are in many other places both among hellenes and barbarians all of them have given to the world many noble works and have been the parents of virtue of every kind and many temples have been raised in their honour for the sake of their children which were never raised in honour of any one for the sake of his mortal children there are the lesser mysteries of love into which even you socrates may enter to the greater and more hidden ones which are the crown of these and to which if you pursue them in a right spirit they will lead i know not whether you will be able to attain but i will do my utmost to inform you and do you follow if you can for he who would proceed aright in this matter should begin in youth to visit beautiful forms 
and first if he be guided by his instructor aright to love one such form only out of that he should create fair thoughts and soon he will of himself perceive that the beauty of one form is akin to the beauty of another and then if beauty of form in general is his pursuit how foolish would he be not to recognize that the beauty in every form is one and the same and when he perceives this he will abate his violent love of the one which he will despise and deem a small thing and will become a lover of all beautiful forms in the next stage he will consider that the beauty of the mind is more honorable than the beauty of the outward form so that if a virtuous soul have but little comeliness he will be content to love and tend him and will search out and bring to the birth thoughts which may improve the young until he is compelled to contemplate and see the beauty of institutions and laws and to understand that the beauty of them all is of one family and that personal beauty is a trifle and after laws and institutions he will go on to the sciences that he may see their beauty being not like a servant in love with the beauty of one youth or man or institution himself a slave mean and narrow-minded but drawing towards and contemplating the vast sea of beauty he will create many fair and noble thoughts and notions in boundless love of wisdom until on that shore he grows and waxes strong and at last the vision is revealed to him of the single science which is the science of beauty everywhere to this i will proceed please to give me your very best attention he who has been instructed thus far in the things of love and who has learned to see the beautiful in due order and succession when he comes toward the end will suddenly perceive a nature of wondrous beauty and this socrates is the final cause of all our former toils a nature which in the first place is everlasting not growing and decaying or waxing and waning in the next place not fair in one point of view and foul in another or at one time or in one relation or at one place fair at another time or in another relation or at another place foul as if fair to some and foul to others or in the likeness of a face or hands or any other part of the bodily frame or in any form of speech or knowledge or existing in any other being as for example in an animal or in heaven or in earth or in any other place but beauty only absolute separate simple and everlasting which without diminution and without increase or any change is imparted to the ever-growing and perishing beauties of all other things he who under the influence of true love rising upward from these begins to see that beauty is not far from the end and the true order of going or being led by another to the things of love is to use the beauties of earth as steps along which he mounts upwards for the sake of that other beauty going from one to two and from two to all fair forms and from fair forms to fair practices and from fair practices to fair notions until from fair notions he arrives at the notion of absolute beauty and at last knows what the essence of beauty is this my dear socrates said the stranger of montinea is that life above all others which a man should live in the contemplation of beauty absolute a beauty which if you once beheld you would see not to be after the measure of gold and garments and fair boys and youths whose presence now entrances you and you and many a one would be content to live a seeing only and conversing with them without meat or drink if that were possible you only want to be with them and to look at them but what if man had eyes to see the true beauty the divine beauty i mean pure and clear and unalloyed not clogged with the pollutions of mortality and all the colours and vanities of human life thither looking and holding converse with the true beauty divine and simple do you not see that in that communion only beholding beauty with the eye of the mind he will be enabled to bring forth not images of beauty but realities for he has hold not of an image but of a reality and bringing forth and nourishing true virtue to become the friend of god and be immortal if mortal man may would that be an ignoble life jowett plato volume two page fifty eight closely connected in subject with the symposium is the phaedrus as professor jowett observes the two dialogues together contain the whole philosophy of plato on the nature of love which in the republic and in the later writings of plato is only introduced playfully or as a figure of speech but in the phaedrus and symposium love and philosophy join hands and one is an aspect of the other the spiritual and emotional is elevated into the ideal to which in the symposium mankind are described as looking forward and which in the phaedrus as well as in the phaedo they are seeking to recover from a former state of existence we are here introduced to one of the most famous conceptions of plato that of reminiscence or recollection based upon a theory of the prior existence of the soul in the meno already alluded to 
socrates is representing as eliciting from one of meno's slaves correct answers to questions involving a knowledge or apprehension of certain axioms of the science of mathematics which as socrates learns the slave had never been taught socrates argues that since he was never taught these axioms and yet actually knows them he must have known them before his birth and concludes from this to the immortality of the soul in the phaedo this same argument is worked out more fully as we grow up we discover in the exercise of our senses that things are equal in certain respects unequal in many others or again we appropriate to things or acts the qualities for example of beauty goodness justice holiness at the same time we recognize that these are ideals to which in actual experience we never find more than an approximation for we never discover in any really existing thing or act absolute equality or justice or goodness in other words any act of judgment on our part of actual experiences consists in a measuring of these experiences by standards which we give or apply to them and which no number of experiences can give to us because they do not possess or exemplify them we did not consciously possess these notions or ideals or ideas as he prefers to call them at birth they come into consciousness in connection with or in consequence of the action of the senses but since the senses could not give these ideas the process of knowledge must be a process of recollection socrates carries the argument a step further then may we not say he continues that if as we are always repeating there is an absolute beauty and goodness and other similar ideas or essences and to this standard which is now discovered to have existed in our former state we refer all our sensations and with this compare them assuming these ideas to have a prior existence then our souls must have had a prior existence but if not not there is the same proof that these ideas must have existed before we were born as that our souls existed before we were born and if not the ideas then not the souls in the phaedrus this conception of a former existence is embodied in one of the myths in which plato's imaginative powers are seen at their highest in it the soul is compared to a charioteer driving two winged steeds one mortal the other immortal the one ever tending towards the earth the other seeking ever to soar into the sky where it may behold those blessed visions of loveliness and wisdom and goodness which are the true nurture of the soul when the chariots of the gods go forth in mighty and glorious procession the soul would fain ride forth in their train but alas the mortal steed is ever hampering the immortal and dragging it down if the soul yields to this influence and descends to earth there she takes human form but in higher or lower degree according to the measure of her vision of the truth she may become a philosopher a king a trader an athlete a prophet a poet a husbandman a sophist a tyrant but whatever her lot according to her manner of life in it may she rise or sink still further even to a beast or plant only those souls take the form of humanity that have had some vision of eternal truth and this vision they retain in a measure even when clogged in mortal clay and so the soul of man is ever striving and fluttering after something beyond and specially is she stirred to aspiration by the sight of bodily loveliness then above all comes the test of good and evil in the soul the nature that has been corrupted would fain rush to brutal joys but the purer nature looks with reverence and wonder at this beauty for it is an adumbration of the celestial joys which he still remembers vaguely from the heavenly vision and thus pure and holy love becomes an opening back to heaven it is a source of happiness unalloyed on earth it guides the lovers on upward wings back to heaven whence they came end of section fourteen section fifteen of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen plato continued and now we pass to the central and crowning work of plato the republic or of justice the longest with one exception and certainly the greatest of all his works it combines the humour and irony the vivid characterization and lively dialogue of his earlier works with the larger and more serious view the more constructive and statesmanlike aims of his later life the dialogue opens very beautifully there has been a festal procession at the piraeus the harbour of athens and socrates with a companion is wending his way homeward when he is recalled by other companions who induce him to visit the house of an aged friend of his cephalus whom he does not visit too often him he finds seated in his court crowned as the custom was for the celebration of a family sacrifice and beholds beaming on his face the peace of a life well spent and reconciled they talk of the happiness that comes in old age to those who have done good and not evil 
and who are not too severely tried in the matter of worldly cares life to this good old man seems a very simple matter duty to god duty to one's neighbours each according to what is prescribed and orderly this is all and this is sufficient then comes in the questioning socrates with his doubts and difficulties as to what is one's duty in special circumstances and the discussion is taken up not by the good old man who goes away to the sacrifice but by his son who can quote the authorities and by thrasymachus the sophist who will have nothing to do with authority but maintains that interest is the only real meaning of justice and that might is right socrates by analogy of the arts shows that might absolutely without tincture of justice is mere weakness and that there is honour even among thieves yet the exhibition of the law working in the members seems to have its weak side so long as we look to individual men in whom there are many conflicting influences and many personal chances and difficulties which obscure the relation between just action and happiness socrates therefore will have justice writ large in the community as a whole first pictured in its simpler and then in its more complex and luxurious forms the relation of the individual to the community is represented chiefly as one of education and training and many strange theories as of the equal training of men and women and the community of wives ideas partially drawn from sparta are woven into the ideal structure then the dialogue rises to a larger view of education as a preparation of the soul of man not for a community on earth but for that heavenly life which was suggested above in the myth of the steeds the purely earthly unideal life is represented as a life of men tied neck and heels from birth in a cave having their backs to the light and their eyes fixed only on the shadows which are cast upon the wall these they take for the only realities and they may acquire much skill in interpreting the shadows turn these men suddenly to the true light and they will be dazzled and blinded they will feel as though they had lost the realities and been plunged into dreams and in pain and sorrow they will be tempted to grope back again to the familiar darkness yet if they hold on in patience and struggle up the steep till the sun himself breaks on their vision what pain and dazzling once more yet at the last what glorious revelation true if they revisit their old dwelling place they will not see as well as their fellows who are still living contentedly there knowing nothing other than the shadows they may even seem to these as dreamers who have lost their senses and should they try to enlighten these denizens of the cave they may be persecuted or even put to death such are the men who have had a sight of the heavenly verities when compared with the children of earth and darkness yet the world will never be right till those who have had this vision come back to the things of earth and order them according to the eternal verities the philosopher must be king if ever the perfect life is to be lived on earth either by individual or community as it would be expressed in scriptural language the kingdoms of this world must become the kingdoms of the lord and of his christ for the training of these ideal rulers an ideal education is required which plato calls dialectic something of its nature is described later on and we need not linger over it here the argument then seems to fall to a lower level there are various approximations in actual experience to the ideal community each more or less perfect according to the degree in which the good of the individual is also made the good of all and the interests of governors and governed are alike parallel with each lower form of state is a lower individual nature the worst of all being that of the tyrant whose will is his only law and his own self-indulgence his only motive in him indeed might is right but his life is the very antithesis of happiness nay pleasure of any kind can give no law to reason reason can judge of pleasure but not vice versa there is no profit to a man though he gain the whole world if himself be lost if he become worse if the better part of him be silenced and grow weaker and after this fitful fever is over may there not be a greater bliss beyond there have been stories told us visions of another world where each man is rewarded according to his works and the book closes with a magnificent vision of judgment it is the story of er son of armenius who being wounded in battle after twelve days trance comes back to life and tells of the judgment seat of heavenly bliss and hellish punishments and of the renewal of life and the new choice given to souls not yet purified wholly of sin god is blameless man's soul is immortal justice and truth are the only things eternally good such is the final revelation the timaeus is an attempt by plato under the guise of a pythagorean philosopher to imagine forth as in a vision or dream the actual framing of the universe conceived as a realization of the eternal thought or idea 
it will be remembered that in the analysis already given of the process of knowledge in individual men plato found that prior to the suggestions of the senses though not coming into consciousness except in connection with sensation men had ideas that gave them a power of rendering their sensations intelligible in the timaeus plato attempts a vision of the universe as though he saw it working itself into actuality on the lines of those ideas the vision is briefly as follows there is the eternal creator who desired to make the world because he was good and free from jealousy and therefore willed that all things should be like himself that is that the formless chaotic unrealized void might receive form and order and become in short real as he was thus creation is the process by which the eternal creator works out his own image his own ideas in and through that which is formless that which has no name which is nothing but possibility dead earth namely or matter and first the world soul image of the divine is formed on which as on a diamond network the manifold structure of things is fashioned the stars the seven planets with their sphere music the four elements and all the various creatures ethereal or fiery aerial aqueous and earthy with the consummation of them all in microcosm in the animal world and especially in man one can easily see that this is an attempt by plato to carry out the reverse process in thought to that which first comes to thinking man man has sensations that is he comes first upon that which is conceivably last in creation on the immediate and temporary things or momentary occurrences of earth in these sensations as they accumulate into a kind of habitual or unreasoned knowledge or opinion he discovers elements which have been active to correlate the sensations which have from the first exercised a governing influence upon the sensations without which indeed no two sensations could be brought together to form anything one could name these regulative underlying permanent elements are ideas that is general forms or notions which although they may come second as regards time into consciousness are by reason known to have been there before because through them alone can the sensations become intelligibly possible or thinkable or nameable thus plato is led to the conception of an order the reverse of our individual experience the order of creation the order of god's thought which is equivalent to the order of god's working for god's thought and god's working are inseparable of course plato in working out his dream of creation absolutely without any scientific knowledge the further he travels the more obviously falls into confusion and absurdity where he touches on some ideas having a certain resemblance to modern scientific discoveries as the law of gravitation the circulation of the blood the quantitative basis of differences of quality etc these happy guesses are apt to lead more frequently wrong than right because they are not kept in check by any experimental tests but taken as a myth which is perhaps all that plato intended the work offers much that is profoundly interesting with the timaeus is associated another dialogue called the critias which remains only as a fragment in it is contained a description of the celebrated visionary kingdom of atlantis lying far beyond the pillars of hercules a land of splendor and luxury and power a land also of gentle manners and wise orderliness the fiction has exercised a great influence over the imagination of later ages as many attempts have been made to find the great island as to discover the country of the lost tribes without regard to the description of plato and without a suspicion that the whole narrative is a fabrication interpreters have looked for the spot in every part of the globe america palestine arabia felix ceylon sardinia sweden the story had also an effect on the early navigators of the 16th century jowett plato volume 3 page 679 end of section 15 section 16 of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 16 plato continued we now come to a series of highly important dialogues marked as a whole by a certain diminution in the purely artistic attraction having less of vivid characterization less humor less dramatic interest less perfect construction in every way but on the other hand peculiarly interesting as presenting a kind of after criticism of his own philosophy in them plato brings his philosophic conceptions into striking relation with earlier or rival theories such as the eleatic the megarian the cyrenaic and the cynic and touches in these connections on many problems of deep and permanent import the most remarkable feature in these later dialogues is the disappearance or even in some cases the apparently hostile criticism of the doctrine of ideas and consequently of reminiscence as the source of knowledge and even apparently of personal immortality so far as the doctrine of reminiscence was imagined to guarantee it 
this however is perhaps to push the change of view too far we may say that plato in these dialogues is rather the psychologist than the metaphysician he is attempting a revised analysis of mental processes from this point of view it was quite intelligible that he should discover difficulties in his former theory of our mental relation to the external reality without therefore seeing reason to doubt the existence of that reality the position is somewhat similar to that of a modern philosopher who attempts to think out the psychological problem of human will in relation to almighty and overruling providence one may very clearly see the psychological difficulties without ceasing to believe either in the one or the other as facts throughout plato's philosophy amidst every variation of expression we may take these three as practically fixed points of belief or of faith or at least of hope first that mind is eternally master of the universe second that man in realizing what is most truly himself is working in harmony with the eternal mind and is in this way a master of nature reason governing experience and not being a product of experience and thirdly as socrates said before his judges that at death we go to powers who are wise and good and to men departed who in their day shared in the divine wisdom and goodness that in short there is something remaining for the dead and better for those that have done good than for those that have done evil the first of the psychological dialogues as we have called them is the philebus the question here is of the summum bonum or chief good what is it is it pleasure is it wisdom or is it both in the process of answering these questions plato lays down rules for true definition and establishes classifications which had an immense influence on his successor aristotle but which need not be further referred to here the general gist of the argument is as follows pleasure could not be regarded as a sufficient or perfect good if it was entirely emptied of the purely intellectual elements of anticipation and consciousness and memory this would be no better than the pleasure of an oyster on the other hand a purely intellectual existence can hardly be regarded as perfect and sufficient either the perfect life must be a union of both but this union must be an orderly and rational union in other words it must be one in which mind is master and pleasure servant the finite the regular the universal must govern the indefinite variable particular thus in the perfect life there are four elements in the body earth water air fire in the soul the finite the indefinite the union of the two and the cause of that union if this be so he argues may we not by analogy argue for a like fourfold order in the universe there also we find regulative elements and indefinite elements and the union of the two must there not also be the great cause even divine wisdom ordering and governing all things the second of the psychological series is the parmenides in which the great eleatic philosopher in company with his disciple zeno is imagined instructing the youthful socrates when the two were on a visit to athens which may or may not be historical the most striking portion of this dialogue is the criticism already alluded to of plato's own theory of ideas put into the mouth of parmenides parmenides ascertains from socrates that he is quite clear about there being ideas of justice beauty goodness eternally existing but how about ideas of such common things as hair mud filth etc socrates is not so sure to which parmenides rejoins that as he grows older philosophy will take a surer hold of him and that he will recognize the same law in small things and in great but now as to the nature of these ideas what parmenides asks is the relation of these as eternally existing in the mind of god to the same ideas as possessed by individual men does each individual actually partake in the thought of god through the ideas or are his ideas only resemblances of the eternal if he partakes then the eternal ideas are not one but many as many as the persons who possess them if his ideas only resemble then there must be some basis of reference by which the resemblance is established a tertium quid or third existence resembling both and so ad infinitum socrates is puzzled by this and suggests that perhaps the ideas are only notions in our minds but to this it is replied that there is an end in that case of any reality in our ideas unless in some way they have a true and causal relation with something beyond our minds there is an end of mind altogether and with mind gone everything goes this as professor jowett remarks remains a difficulty for us as well as for the greeks of the fourth century before christ and is the stumbling block of kant's critic and of the hamiltonian adaptation of kant as well as of the platonic ideas it has been said that you cannot criticize revelation 
then how do you know what is revelation or that there is one at all is the immediate rejoinder you know nothing of things in themselves then how do you know that there are things in themselves in some respects the difficulty pressed harder upon the greek than upon ourselves for conceiving of god more under the attribute of knowledge than we do he was more under the necessity of separating the divine from the human as two spheres which had no communication with one another next follows an extraordinary analysis of the ideas of being and unity remarkable not only for its subtlety but for the relation which it historically bears to the modern philosophic system of hegel every affirmation is ipso facto a negation the negation of a negation is an affirmation these are the psychological if not metaphysical facts on which the analysis of parmenides and the philosophy of hegel are both founded we may pass more rapidly by the succeeding dialogues of the series the theotetus already quoted from above which is a powerful investigation of the nature of knowledge on familiar platonic lines the sophist which is an analysis of fallacious reasoning and the statesman which under the guise of a dialectical search for the true ruler of men represents once more plato's ideal of government and contrasts this with the ignorance and charlatanism of actual politics in relation to subsequent psychology and more particularly to the logical system of aristotle these dialogues are extremely important we may indeed say that the systemic logic of aristotle as contained in the organon is little more than an abstract or digest of the logical theses of these dialogues definition and division the nature and principle of classification the theory of predication the processes of induction and deduction the classification and criticism of fallacies all these are to be found in them the only addition really made by aristotle was the systematic theory of the syllogism the laws the longest of plato's works seems to have been composed by him in the latest years of his long life and was probably not published till after his death it bears traces of its later origin in the less artful juncture of its parts in the absence of humour in the greater overloading of details in the less graphic and appropriate characterization of the speakers these speakers are three an athenian a cretan and a spartan a new colony is to be led forth from crete and the cretan takes advice of the others as to the ordering of the new commonwealth we are no longer as in the republic in an ideal world a city coming down from or set in the heavens there is no longer a perfect community nor are philosophers to be its kings laws more or less similar to those of sparta fill about half the book but the old spirit of obedience and self-sacrifice and community is not forgotten and on all men and women noble and humble alike the duty is cast to bear in common the common burden of life thus somewhat in sadness and decay yet with a dignity and moral grandeur not unworthy of his life's high argument the great procession of the ideal philosopher's dialogues closes end of section sixteen section seventeen of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen plato concluded if we attempt now by way of appendix to this very inadequate summary of the dialogues to give in brief review some account of the main doctrines of plato as they may be gathered from a general view of them we are at once met by difficulties many and serious in the case of a genius such as plato's at once ironical dramatic and allegorical we cannot be absolutely certain that in any given passage plato is expressing at all events adequately and completely his own personal views even at the particular stage of his own mental development then represented and when we add to this that in a long life of unceasing intellectual development plato inevitably grew out of much that once satisfied him and attained not infrequently to new points of view even of doctrines or conceptions which remained essentially unchanged a platonic dogma in the strict sense must clearly not be expected one may however attempt in rough outline to summarize the main tendencies of his thought without professing to represent its settled and authenticated results we may begin by an important summary of plato's philosophy given by aristotle metaphysics a six in immediate succession to the pythagorean and eleatic philosophies came the work of plato in many respects his views coincided with these in some respects however he is independent of the italians for in early youth he became a student of cratylus and of the school of heraclitus and accepted from them the view that the objects of sense are in eternal flux and that of these therefore there can be no absolute knowledge then came socrates who busied himself only with questions of morals 
and not at all with the world of physics but in his ethical inquiries his search was ever for universals and he was the first to set his mind to the discovery of definitions plato following him in this came to the conclusion that these universals could not belong to the things of sense which were ever changing but to some other kind of existences thus he came to conceive of universals as forms or ideas of real existences by reference to which and in consequence of analogies to which the things of sense in every case received their names and became thinkable objects from this it followed to plato that in so far as the senses took an elusive appearance of themselves giving the knowledge which really was supplied by reason as the organ of ideas in the same degree the body which is the instrument of sense can only be a source of illusion and a hindrance to knowledge the wise man therefore will seek to free himself from the bonds of the body and die while he lives by philosophic contemplation free as far as possible from the disturbing influence of the senses this process of rational realization plato called dialectic the objects contemplated by the reason brought into consciousness on the occurrence of sensible perception but never caused by these were not mere notions in the mind of the individual thinker nor were they mere properties of individual things this would be to make an end of science on the one hand of reality on the other nor had they existence in any mere place not even beyond the heavens their home was mind not this mind or that but mind universal which is god in these thoughts of god was the root or essence which gave reality to the things of sense they were the unity which realized itself in multiplicity it is because things partake of the idea that we give them a name the thing as such is seen not known the idea as such is known not seen the whole conception of plato in this connection is based on the assumption that there is such a thing as knowledge if all things are ever in change then knowledge is impossible but conversely if there is such a thing as knowledge then there must be a continuing object of knowledge and beauty goodness reality are then no dreams the process of apprehension of these thoughts of god these eternal objects of knowledge whether occasioned by sensation or not is essentially a process of self-inquiry or as he in one stage called it of reminiscence the process is the same in essence whether going on in thought or expressed in speech it is a process of naming not that names ever resemble realities fully they are only approximations limited by the conditions of human error and human convention there is nevertheless an intercommunion between ideas and things we must neither go entirely with those who affirm the one the eleatics nor with those who affirm the many the heraclitians but accept both there is a union in all that exists both of that which is and of that concerning which all we can say is that it is other than what is this other through union with what is attains to being of a kind while on the other hand what is by union with the other attains to variety and thus more fully realizes itself that which plato here calls what is he elsewhere calls the limiting or defining the other he calls the unlimited or undefined each has a function in the divine process the thoughts of god attain realization in the world of things which change and pass through the infusion of themselves in or the superimposing of themselves upon that which is nothing apart from them the mere negation of what is and yet necessary as the other or correlative of what is thus we get in fact four forms of existence there is the idea or limiting a part there is the negative or unlimited a part there is the union of the two represented in language by subject and predicate which as a whole is this frame of things as we know it and fourthly there is the cause of the union which is god and god is cause not only as the beginning of all things but also as the measure and law of their perfection and the end towards which they go he is the good and the cause of good and the consummation and realization of good this absolute being this perfect good we cannot see blinded as we are like men that have been dwelling in a cave by excess of light we must therefore look on him indirectly as on an image of him in our own souls and in the world in so far as in either we discern by reason that which is rational and good thus god is not only the cause and the end of all good he is also the cause and the end of all knowledge even as the sun is not only the most glorious of all visible objects but is also the cause of the life and beauty of all other things and the provider of the light whereby we see them so also is it for the eye of the soul god is its light god is the most glorious object of its contemplation 
god we behold imaged forth in all the objects which the soul by reason contemplates the ideas whereof the other or as he again calls it the great and small or more and less meaning that which is unnameable or wholly neutral in character and which may therefore be represented equally by contradictory attributes by participation becomes a resemblance plato compared to the numbers of the pythagoreans hence aristotle remarks metaphysics a six plato found in the ideas the originative or formative cause of things that which made them what they were or could be called their essence in the great and small he found the opposite principle or matter raw material of things in this way the antithesis of mind and matter whether on the great scale in creation or on the small in rational perception is not an antithesis of unrelated opposition each is correlative of the other so to speak as the male and the female the one is generative formative active positive the other is capable of being impregnated receptive passive negative but neither can realize itself apart from the other this relation of being with that which is other than being is creation wherein we can conceive of the world as coming to be yet not in time and in the same way plato speaks of a third form besides the idea and that which receives it namely formless space the mother of all things as kant might have formulated it time and space are not prior to creation they are forms under which creation becomes thinkable the other or negative element plato more or less vaguely connected with the evil that is in the world this evil we can never expect to perish utterly from the world it must ever be here as the antithesis of the good but with the gods it dwells not here in this mortal nature and in this region of mingling it must of necessity still be found the wise man will therefore seek to die to the evil and while yet in this world of mortality to think immortal things and so as far as may be flee from the evil thereby shall he liken himself to the divine for it is a likening to the divine to be just and holy and true this then is the summum bonum the end of life for as the excellence or end of any organ or instrument consists in that perfection of its parts whereby each separately and the whole together work well towards the fulfilling of that which it is designed to accomplish so the excellence of man must consist in a perfect ordering of all his parts to the perfect working of his whole organism as a rational being the faculties of man are three the desire of the body the passion of the heart the thought of the soul the perfect working of all three temperance courage wisdom and consequently the perfect working of the whole man is righteousness from this springs that ordered tranquillity which is at once true happiness and perfect virtue yet since individual men are not self-sufficient but have separate capacities and a need of union for mutual help and comfort the perfect realization of this virtue can only be in a perfect civic community and corresponding with the three parts of the man there will be three orders in the community the workers and traders the soldiers and the ruling or guardian class when all these perform their proper functions in perfect harmony then is the perfection of the whole realized in civic excellence or justice to this end a careful civic education is necessary first because to know what is for the general good is difficult for we have to learn not only in general but in detail that even the individual good can be secured only through the general and second because few if any are capable of seeking the general good even if they know it without the guidance of discipline and the restraints of law thus with a view to its own perfection and the good of all of its members education is the chief work of the state it will be remembered that in plato's division of the soul of man there are three faculties desire passion reason in the division of the soul's perfection three corresponding virtues temperance courage wisdom and in the division of the state three corresponding orders traders soldiers guardians so in education there are three stages first music including all manner of artistic and refining influences whose function it is so to attemper the desires of the heart that all animalism and sensualism may be eliminated and only the love and longing for that which is lovely and of good report may remain second gymnastic whose function it is through ordered labor and suffering so to subdue and rationalize the passionate part of the soul that it may become the willing and obedient servant of that which is just and true and third mathematics by which the rational element of the soul may be trained to realize itself being weaned by the ordered apprehension of the diamond net of laws which underlie all the phenomena of nature away from the mere surface appearances of things
the accidental individual momentary to the deep-seated realities which are necessary universal eternal and just as there was a perfectness of the soul transcending all particular virtues whether of temperance or courage or wisdom namely that absolute rightness or righteousness which gathered them all into itself so at the end of these three stages of education there is a higher mood of thought wherein the soul purified chastened enlightened in communing with itself through dialectic the socratic art of questioning transfigured communes also with the divine and in thinking out its own deepest thoughts thinks out the thoughts of the great creator himself becomes one with him finds its final realization through absorption into him and in his light sees light end of section 17 section 18 of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 18 aristotle plato before his death bequeathed his academy to his nephew spusippus who continued its president for eight years and on his death the office passed to xenocrates who held it for twenty-five years from him it passed in succession to polemo crates crantor and others plato was thus the founder of a school or sect of teachers who busied themselves with commenting expanding modifying here and there the doctrines of the master little of their works beyond the names has been preserved and indeed we can hardly regret the loss these men no doubt did much to popularize the thoughts of their master and in this way largely influenced the later development of philosophy but they had nothing substantial to add and so the stern pruning hook of time has cut them off from remembrance aristotle was the son of a greek physician member of the colony of stagira in thrace his father nicomachus by name was a man of such eminence in his profession as to hold the post of physician to amyntas king of macedonia father of philip the subverter of greek freedom not only was his father an expert physician he was also a student of natural history and wrote several works on the subject we shall find that the fresh element which aristotle brought to the academic philosophy was in a very great measure just that minute attention to details and keen apprehension of vital phenomena which we may consider he inherited from his father he was born 384 b c and on the death of his father in his eighteenth year he came to athens and became a student of philosophy under plato whose pupil he continued to be for twenty years indeed till the death of the master that he undoubtedly a far greater man than spusippus or xenocrates should not have been nominated to the succession has been variously explained he is said to have been lacking in respect and gratitude to the master plato is said to have remarked of him that he needed the curb as much as xenocrates needed the spur the facts really need no explanation the original genius is never sufficiently subordinate and amenable to discipline he is apt to be critical to startle his easy-going companions with new and seemingly heterodox views he is the ugly duckling whom all the virtuous and commonplace brood must cackle at the academy when its great master died was no place for aristotle he retired to artanius a city of mysia opposite to lesbos where a friend named hermias was tyrant and there he married hermias's niece after staying at artanius some three years he was invited by philip now king of macedon to undertake the instruction of his son alexander the future conqueror who was then thirteen years old he remained with alexander for eight years though of course he could hardly be regarded as alexander's tutor during all that time since alexander at a very early age was called to take part in public affairs however a strong friendship was formed between the philosopher and the young prince and in after years alexander loaded his former master with benefits even while on his march of conquest through asia he did not forget him but sent him from every country through which he passed specimens which might help him in his projected history of animals as well as an enormous sum of money to aid him in his investigations after the death of philip aristotle returned to athens and opened a school of philosophy on his own account in the lyceum here some authorities tell us he lectured to his pupils while he paced up and down before them hence the epithet applied to the school the peripatetics probably however the name is derived from the peripati or covered walks in the neighborhood of that temple in which he taught he devoted his mornings to lectures of a more philosophical and technical character to these only the abler and more advanced students were admitted in the afternoons he lectured on subjects of a more popular kind rhetoric the art of politics etc to larger audiences corresponding with this division he also was in the habit of classifying his writings as acroatic or technical 
and exoteric or popular. He accumulated a large library and museum, to which he contributed an astonishing number of works of his own, on every conceivable branch of knowledge. The after-history of Aristotle's library, including the manuscripts of his own works, is interesting and even romantic. Aristotle's successor in the school was Theophrastus, who added to the library bequeathed him by Aristotle many works of his own, and others purchased by him. Theophrastus bequeathed the entire library to Neleus, his friend and pupil, who on leaving Athens to reside at Skepsis in the Troad, took the library with him. There it remained for nearly two hundred years in possession of the Neleus family, who kept the collection hidden in a cellar for fear it should be seized to increase the royal library of Pergamus. In such a situation the works suffered much harm from worms and damp, till at last, circa 100 BC, they were brought out and sold to one Apelicon, a rich gentleman resident in Athens, himself a member of the peripatetic school. In 86 BC Sulla, the Roman dictator, besieged and captured Athens, and among other prizes conveyed the library of Apelicon to Rome, and thus many of the most important works of Aristotle for the first time were made known to the Roman and Alexandrian school. It is a curious circumstance that the philosopher whose influence was destined to be paramount for more than a thousand years in the Christian era was thus deprived by accident of his legitimate importance in the centuries immediately following his own. But his temporary and accidental eclipse was amply compensated in the effect upon the civilized world which he subsequently exercised. So all-embracing, so systematic, so absolutely complete did his philosophy appear that he seemed to after generations to have left nothing more to discover. He at once attained a supremacy which lasted for some two thousand years, not only over the Greek-speaking world, but over every form of the civilization of that long period, Greek, Roman, Syrian, Arabic, from the Euphrates to the Atlantic, from Africa to Britain. His authority was accepted equally by the learned doctors of Moorish Cordova and the fathers of the church. To know Aristotle was to have all knowledge, not to know him was to be a boor, to deny him was to be a heretic. His style has nothing of the grace of Plato. He illuminates his works with no myths or allegories. His manner is dry, sententious, familiar, without the slightest attempt at ornament. There are occasional touches of caustic humour, but nothing of emotion, still less of rhapsody. His strength lies in the vast architectonic genius by which he correlates every domain of the knowable in a single scheme, and in the extraordinary faculty for illustrative detail with which he fills the scheme in every part. He knows and can shrewdly criticise every thinker and writer who has preceded him. He classifies them as he classifies the mental faculties, the parts of logical speech, the parts of sophistry, the parts of rhetoric, the parts of animals, the parts of the soul, the parts of the state. He defines, distinguishes, combines, classifies with the same sureness and minuteness of method in them all. He can start from a general conception, expand it into its parts, separate these again by distinguishing details till he brings the matter down to its lowest possible terms, or infimi species. Or he can start from these, find analogies among them constituting more general species, and so in ascending scale travel surely up to a general conception, or summum genus. In his general conception of philosophy he was to a large extent in agreement with Plato, but he endeavoured to attain to a more technical precision. He sought to systematise into greater completeness. He pared off everything which he considered merely metaphorical or fanciful, and therefore non-essential. The operations of nature, the phenomena of life, were used in a much fuller and more definite way to illustrate or even formulate the theory. But in its main ideas Aristotle's philosophy is Plato's philosophy. The one clothed it in poetry, the other in formulae. The one had a more entrancing vision, the other a clearer and more exact apprehension. But there is no essential divergence. Aristotle's account of the origin or foundation of philosophy is as follows. Metaphysics A. 2. Wonder is and always has been the first incentive to philosophy. At first men wondered at what puzzled them near at hand. Then by gradual advance they came to notice and wonder at things still greater, as at the phases of the moon, the eclipses of sun and moon, the wonders of the stars, and the origin of the universe. Now he who is puzzled and in a maze regards himself as a know-nothing, Wherefore the philosopher is apt to be fond of wondrous tales or myths. And inasmuch as it was a consciousness of ignorance that drove men to philosophy, it is for the correction of this ignorance, and not for any material utility, that the pursuit of knowledge exists. 
indeed it is as a rule only when all other wants are well supplied that by way of ease and recreation men turn to this inquiry and thus since no satisfaction beyond itself is sought by philosophy we speak of it as we speak of the free man we call that man free whose existence is for himself and not for another so also philosophy is of all the sciences the only one that is free for it alone exists for itself moreover this philosophy which is the investigation of the first causes of things is the most truly educative among the sciences for instructors are persons who show us the causes of things and knowledge for the sake of knowledge belongs most properly to that inquiry which deals with what is most truly a matter of knowledge for he who is seeking knowledge for its own sake will choose to have that knowledge which most truly deserves the name the knowledge namely of what most truly appertains to knowledge now the things that most truly appertain to knowledge are the first causes for in virtue of one's possession of these and by deduction from these all else comes to be known we do not come to know them through what is inferior to them and underlying them the wise man ought therefore to know not only those things which are the outcome and product of first causes he must be possessed of the truth as to the first causes themselves and wisdom indeed is just this thoughtful science a science of what is highest not truncated of its head to the man therefore who has in fullest measure this knowledge of universals all knowledge must lie to hand for in a way he knows all that underlies them yet in a sense these universals are what men find hardest to apprehend because they stand at the furthest extremity from the perceptions of sense yet if anything exist which is eternal immovable freed from gross matter the contemplative science alone can apprehend this physical science certainly cannot for physics is of that which is ever in flux nor can mathematical science apprehend it we must look to a mode of science prior to and higher than both the objects of physics are neither unchangeable nor free from matter the objects of mathematics are indeed unchangeable but we can hardly say they are free from matter they have certainly relations with matter but the first and highest science has to do with that which is unmoved and apart from matter its function is with the eternal first causes of things there are therefore three modes of theoretical inquiry the science of physics the science of mathematics the science of god for it is clear that if the divine is anywhere it must be in that form of existence i have spoken of that is in first causes if therefore there be any form of existence immovable this we must regard as prior and the philosophy of this we must consider the first philosophy universal for the same reason that it is first it deals with existence as such inquiring what it is and what are its attributes as pure existence this is somewhat more technical than the language of plato but if we compare it with what was said above we shall find an essential identity yet aristotle frequently impugns plato's doctrine of ideas sometimes on the lines already taken by plato himself sometimes in other ways thus he says that which is one cannot be in many places at one time but that which is common or general is in many places at one time hence it follows that no universal exists apart from the individual things but those who hold the doctrine of ideas on one side are right namely in maintaining their separate existence if they are to be substances or existences at all on the other side they are wrong because by the idea or form which they maintain to be separate they mean the one attribute predicable of many things the reason why they do this is because they cannot indicate what these supposed imperishable essences are apart from the individual substances which are the objects of perception the result is that they simply represent them under the same forms as those of the perishable objects of sensation which are familiar to our senses with the addition of a phrase that is they say man as such horse as such or the absolute man the absolute horse aristotle here makes a point against plato and his school inasmuch as starting from the assumption that of the world of sense there could be no knowledge no apprehension fixed or certain and setting over against this a world of general forms which were fixed and certain they had nothing with which to fill this second supposed world except the data of senses found in individuals plato's mistake was in confusing the mere this which is the conceived starting point of any sensation but which like a mathematical point has nothing which can be said about it with individual objects as they exist and are known in all the manifold and in fact infinite relations of reality the bare subject this presents at the one extreme the same emptiness the same mere possibility of knowledge which is presented at the other by the bare predicate is 
but plato having an objection to the former as representing to him the merely physical and therefore the passing and unreal clothes it for the nonce in the various attributes which are ordinarily associated with it when we say this man this horse only to strip them off successively as data of sensation and so at last get by an illusory process of abstraction and generalization to the ultimate generality of being which is the mere is of bare predication converted into a supposed eternal substance aristotle was as convinced as plato that there must be some fixed and immovable object or reality corresponding to true and certain knowledge but with his scientific instincts he was not content to have it left in a condition of emptiness attractive enough to the more emotional and imaginative plato and hence we have elsewhere quite as strong and definite statements as those quoted above about universals to the effect that existence is in the fullest and most real sense to be predicated of individual things and that only in a secondary sense can existence be predicated of universals in virtue of their being found in individual things moreover among universals the species he maintains has more of existence in it than the genus because it is nearer to the individual or primary existence for if you predicate of an individual thing of what species it is you supply a statement more full of information and more closely connected with the thing than if you predicate to what genus it belongs for example if asked what is this and you answer a man you give more information than if you say a living creature how did aristotle reconcile these two points of view the one in which he conceives thought as starting from first causes the most universal objects of knowledge and descending to particulars the other in which thought starts from the individual objects and predicates of them by apprehension of their properties the antithesis is no accidental one on the contrary it is the governing idea of his logic with its ascending process or induction and its descending process or syllogism was thought a mere process in an unmeaning circle the upward and downward way of plato as to this we may answer first that while formerly aristotle displays much the same dualism or unreconciled separation of the thing and the idea as plato his practical sense and his scientific instincts led him to occupy himself largely not with either the empty thing or the equally empty idea but with the true individuals which are at the same time the true universals namely real objects as known having so far as they are known certain forms or categories under which you can class them having so far as they are not yet fully known a certain raw material for further inquiry through observation in this way thought and matter instead of being in eternal and irreconcilable antagonism as the real and the unreal become parts of the same reality the first summing up the knowledge of things already attained the second symbolizing the infinite possibilities of further ascertainment and thus the word matter is applied by aristotle to the highest genus as the relatively indefinite compared with the more fully defined species included under it it is also applied by him to the individual object in so far as that object contains qualities not yet fully brought into predication and second we observe that aristotle introduced a new conception which to his view established a vital relation between the universal and the individual this conception he formulated in the correlatives potentiality and actuality with these he closely connected the idea of final cause the three to aristotle constituted a single reality they are organically correlated in a living creature we find a number of members or organs all closely interdependent and mutually conditioning each other each has its separate function yet none of them can perform its particular function well unless all the others are performing theirs well and the effect of the right performance of function by each is to enable the others also to perform theirs the total result of all these mutually related functions is life this is their end or final cause which does not exist apart from them but is constituted at every moment by them this life is at the same time the condition on which alone each and every one of the functions constituting it can be performed thus life in an organism is at once the end and the middle and the beginning it is the cause final the cause formal the cause efficient life then is an entelechy as aristotle calls it by which he means the realization in unity of the total activities exhibited in the members of the living organism in such an existence every part is at once a potentiality and an actuality and so also is the whole we can begin anywhere and travel out from that point to the whole we can take the whole and find it in all the parts end of section eighteen section nineteen of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain
Chapter 19. Aristotle Continued If we look closely at this conception of Aristotle's, we shall see that it has a nearer relation to the Platonic doctrine of ideas, and even to the doctrine of reminiscence, than perhaps even Aristotle himself realized. The fundamental conception of Plato, it will be remembered, is that of an eternally existing thought of God in manifold forms or ideas, which come into the consciousness of men in connection with or on occasion of sensations, which are therefore in our experience later than the sensations, but which we nevertheless by reason recognize as necessarily prior to the sensations, inasmuch as it is through these ideas alone that the sensations are knowable or nameable at all. Thus the final end for man is by contemplation and daily dying to the world of sense, to come at last into the full inheritance in conscious knowledge of that thought of God, which was latent from the first in his soul, and of which in its fullness God himself is eternally and necessarily possessed. This is really Aristotle's idea, only Plato expresses it rather under a psychological, Aristotle under a vital, formula. God, Aristotle says, is eternally and necessarily entelechy, absolute realization. To us, that which is the first in time, the individual perception, is not the first in essence or absolutely. What is first in essence or absolutely is the universal, that is the form or idea, the datum of reason. And this distinction between time and the absolute, between our individual experience and the essential or ultimate reality, runs all through the philosophy of Aristotle. The realization of Aristotle is the reminiscence of Plato. This conception Aristotle extended to thought, to the various forms of life, to education, to morals, to politics. Thought is an entelechy, an organic whole, in which every process conditions and is conditioned by every other. If we begin with sensation, the sensation, blank as regards predication, has relations to that which is infinitely real, the object, the real thing before us, which relations science will never exhaust. If we start from the other end with the datum of thought, consciousness, existence, mind, this is equally blank as regards predication, yet it has relations to another existence infinitely real, the subject that thinks, which relations religion and morality and sentiment and love will never exhaust. Or, as Aristotle and as common sense prefers to do, if we, with our developed habits of thought and our store of accumulated information, choose to deal with things from a basis midway between the two extremes, in the ordinary way of ordinary people, we shall find both processes working simultaneously and in organic correlation. That is to say, we shall be increasing the individuality of the objects known by the operation of true thought and observation in the discovery of new characters or qualities in them. We shall be increasing by the same act the generality of the objects known by the discovery of new relations, new genera under which to bring them. Individualization and generalization are only opposed as mutually conditioning factors of the same organic function. This analysis of thought must be regarded rather as a paraphrase of Aristotle than as a literal transcript. He is hesitating and obscure, and at times apparently self-contradictory. He has not, any more than Plato, quite cleared himself of the confusion between the mutually contrary individual and universal in propositions and the organically correlative individual and universal in things as known. But on the whole, the tendency of his analysis is towards an apprehension of the true realism, which neither denies matter in favour of mind, nor mind in favour of matter, but recognises that both mind and matter are organically correlated, and ultimately identical. The crux of philosophy, so far as thus apprehended by Aristotle, is no longer in the supposed dualism of mind and matter, but there is a crux still. What is the meaning of this ultimately? Or putting it in Aristotle's formula, why this relation of potentiality and actuality? Why this eternal coming to be, even if the coming to be is no unreasoned accident, but a coming to be of that which is vitally or in germ there? Or theologically, why did God make the world? Why this groaning and travailing of the creature? Why this eternal by and by, wherein all sin is to disappear, all sorrow to be consoled, all the clashings and the infinite deceptions of life to be stilled and satisfied? An illustration of Aristotle's attempt to answer this question will be given later on. That the answer is a failure need not surprise us. If we even now see only as in a glass darkly on such a question, we need not blame Plato or Aristotle for not seeing face to face. Life is an entelechy, not only abstractedly as already shown, but in respect of the varieties of its manifestations. We pass from the elementary life of mere growth common to plants and animals, to the animal life of impulse and sensation, 
thence we rise still higher to the life of rational action which is the peculiar function of man each is a potentiality to that which is immediately above it in other words each contains in germ the possibilities which are realized in that stage which is higher thus is there a touch of nature which makes the whole world kin a purpose running through all the manifestations of life each is a preparation for something higher education is in like matter an entelechy for what is the differentia the distinguishing character of the life of man aristotle answers the possession of reason it is the action of reason upon the desires that raises the life of man above the brutes this observe is not the restraining action of something wholly alien to the desires which is too often how plato represents the matter this would be to lose the dynamic idea the desires as aristotle generally conceives them are there in the animal life prepared so to speak to receive the organic perfection which reason alone can give them intellect on the other hand is equally in need of the desires for thought without desire cannot supply motive if intellect is logos or reason desire is that which is fitted to be obedient to reason it will be remembered that the question to which plato addressed himself in one of his earlier dialogues already frequently referred to the meno was the teachableness of virtue in that dialogue he comes to the conclusion that virtue is teachable but that there are none capable of teaching it for the wise men of the time are guided not by knowledge but by right opinion or by a divine instinct which is incommunicable plato is thus led to seek a machinery of education and it is with a view to this that he constructs his ideal republic aristotle took up this view of the state as educative of the individual citizens and brought it under the dynamic formula in the child reason is not actual there is no rational law governing his acts these are the immediate result of the strongest impulse yet only when a succession of virtuous acts has formed the virtuous habit can a man be said to be truly good how is this process to begin the answer is that the reason which is only latent or dynamic in the child is actual or realized in the parent or teacher or generally in the community which educates the child the law at first then is imposed on the child from without it has an appearance of unnaturalness but only an appearance for the law is there in the child prepared as he goes on in obedience gradually to answer from within to the summons from without till along with the virtuous habit there emerges also into the consciousness of the child no longer a child but a man the apprehension of the law is his own truest nature these remarks on education are sufficient to show that in morals also as conceived by aristotle there is a law of vital development it may be sufficient by way of illustration to quote the introductory sentences of aristotle's ethics in which the question of the nature of the chief good is in his usual tentative manner discussed if there be any end of what we do which we desire for itself while all other ends are desired for it that is if we do not in every case have some ulterior end for if that were so we should go on to infinity and our efforts would be vain and useless this ultimate end desired for itself will clearly be the chief good and the ultimate best now since every activity whether of knowing or doing aims at some good it is for us to settle what the good is which the civic activity aims at what in short is the ultimate end of all goods connected with conduct so far as the name goes all are pretty well agreed as to the answer gentle and simple alike declare it to be happiness involving however in their minds on the one hand well living on the other hand well doing when you ask them however to define this happiness more exactly you find that opinions are divided and the many and the philosophers have different answers but if you ask a musician or a sculptor or any man of skill any person in fact who has some special work and activity what the chief good is for him he will tell you that the chief good is in the work well done if then man has any special work or function we may assume that the chief good for man will be in the well-doing of that function what now is man's special function it cannot be mere living for that he has in common with plants and we are seeking what is peculiar to him the mere life of nurture and growth must therefore be put on one side we come next to life as sensitive to pleasure and pain but this man shares with the horse the ox and other animals what remains is the life of action of a reasonable being now of reason as it is in man there are two parts one obeying one possessing and considering and there are also two aspects in which the active or moral life may be taken one potential one actual 
clearly for our definition of the chief good we must take the moral life in its full actual realization since this is superior to the other if our view thus far be correct it follows that the chief good for man consists in the full realization and perfection of the life of man as man in accordance with the specific excellence belonging to that life and if there be more specific excellences than one then in accordance with that excellence which is the best and the most rounded or complete we must add however the qualification in a rounded life for one swallow does not make a summer nor yet one day and so one day or some brief period of attainment is not sufficient to make a man happy and blessed the close relation of this to the teaching of socrates and plato need hardly be insisted on or the way in which he correlates their ideas with his own conception of an actualized perfection aristotle then proceeds to a definition of the specific excellence or virtue of man which is to be the standard by which we decide how far he has fully and perfectly realized the possibilities of his being to this end he distinguishes in man's nature three modes of existence first feelings such as joy pain anger second potentialities or capacities for such feelings third habits which are built upon these potentialities but with an element of reason or deliberation superadded he has no difficulty in establishing that the virtue of man must be a habit and the test of the excellence of that habit as of every other developed capacity will be twofold it will make the worker good it will cause him to produce good work so far aristotle's analysis of virtue is quite on the lines of his general philosophy here however he diverges into what seems at first a curiously mechanical conception pointing out that in everything quantitative there are two extremes conceivable and a mean or average between them he proceeds to define virtue as a mean between two extremes a mean however having relation to no mere numerical standard but having reference to us in this last qualification he perhaps saves his definition from its mechanical turn while he leaves himself scope for much curious and ingenious observation on the several virtues regarded as means between two extremes he further endeavors to save it by adding that it is defined by reason and as the wise man would define it reason then as the impersonal ruler the wise man as the personification of reason this is the standard of virtue and therefore also of happiness how then shall we escape an externality in our standard divesting it of that binding character which comes only when the law without is also recognized and accepted as the law within the answer of aristotle as of his predecessors is that this will be brought about by wise training and virtuous surroundings in short by the civic community being itself good and happy thus we get another dynamic relation for regarded as a member of the body politic each individual becomes a potentiality along with all the other members conditioned by the state of which he and they are members brought gradually into harmony with the reason which is in the state and in the process realizing not his own possibilities only but those of the community also which exists only in and through its members thus each and all in so far as they realize their own well-being by the perfect development of the virtuous habit in their lives contribute ipso facto to the supreme end of the state which is the perfect realization of the whole possibilities of the total organism and consequently of every member of it the state therefore is also an entelechy for man is not made to dwell alone there is first the fact of sex then the fact of children third the fact of variety of capacity implying variety of position some having greater powers of wisdom and forethought and being therefore naturally the rulers others having bodily powers suitable for carrying out the ruler's designs and being therefore naturally subjects thus we have as a first or simplest community the family next to the village then the full or perfect state which seeking to realize an absolute self-sufficiency within itself rises from mere living to well living as an aim of existence this higher existence is as natural and necessary as any simpler form being in fact the end or final and necessary perfection of all such lower forms of existence man therefore is by the natural necessity of his being a political animal and he who is not a citizen that is by reason of something peculiar in his nature and not by a mere accident must either be deficient or something superhuman and while man is the noblest of animals when thus fully perfected in an ordered community on the other hand when deprived of law and justice he is the very worst for there is nothing so dreadful as lawlessness armed and man is born with the arms of thought and special capacities or excellences which it is quite possible for him to use for other and contrary purposes 
and therefore man is the most wicked and cruel animal living when he is vicious the most lustful and the most gluttonous the justice which restrains all this is a civic quality and law is the orderly arrangement of the civic community aristotle politics one page two end of section nineteen section twenty of a short history of greek philosophy by john marshall this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty aristotle concluded throughout aristotle's physical philosophy the same conception runs all animals in their fully developed state require two members above all one whereby to take in nourishment the other whereby to get rid of what is superfluous for no animal can exist or grow without nourishment and there is a third member in them all halfway between these in which resides the principle of their life this is the heart which all blood possessing animals have from it comes the arterial system which nature has made hollow to contain the liquid blood the situation of the heart is a commanding one being near the middle and rather above than below and rather towards the front than the back for nature ever establishes that which is most honourable in the most honourable places unless some supreme necessity overrules we see this most clearly in the case of man but the same tendency for the heart to occupy the centre is seen also in other animals when we regard only that portion of their body which is essential and the limit of this is at the place where superfluities are removed the limbs are arranged differently in different animals and are not among the parts essential to life consequently animals may live even if these are removed anaxagoras says that man is the wisest of animals because he possesses hands it would be more reasonable to say that he possesses hands because he is the wisest for the hands are an instrument and nature always assigns an instrument to the one fitted to use it just as a sensible man would for it is more reasonable to give a flute to a flute player than to confer on a man who has some flutes the art of playing them to that which is the greater and higher she adds what is less important and not vice versa therefore to the creature fitted to acquire the greatest number of skills nature assigns the hand the instrument useful for the largest number of purposes and in the macrocosm the visible and invisible world about us the same conception holds the existence of god is an eternally perfect entelechy a life everlasting in that therefore which belongs to the divine there must be an eternally perfect movement therefore the heavens which are as it were the body of the divine are in the form of a sphere of necessity ever in circular motion why then is not this true of every portion of the universe because there must of necessity be a point of rest of the circling body at the centre yet the circling body cannot rest either as a whole or as regards any part of it otherwise its motion could not be eternal which by nature it is now that which is a violation of nature cannot be eternal but the violation is posterior to that which is in accordance with nature and thus the unnatural is a kind of displacement or degeneracy from the natural taking the form of a coming into being necessity then requires earth as the element standing still at the centre now if there must be earth there must be fire for if one of two opposites is natural or necessary the other must be necessary too each in fact implying the necessity of the other for the two have the same substantial basis only the positive form is naturally prior to the negative for instance warm is prior to cold and in the same way motionlessness and heaviness are predicated in virtue of the absence of motion and lightness that is the latter are essentially prior further if there are fire and earth there must also be the elements which lie between these each having an antithetic relation to each from this it follows that there must be a process of coming into being because none of these elements can be eternal but each affects and is affected by each and they are mutually destructive now it is not to be argued that anything which can be moved can be eternal except in the case of that which by its own nature has eternal motion and if coming into being must be predicated of these then other forms of change can also be predicated aristotle de quello two page three this passage is worth quoting as illustrating not only aristotle's conception of the divine entelechy but also the ingenuity with which he gave the appearance of logical completeness to the vague and ill-digested scientific imaginations of the time which remained so evil an inheritance for thousands of years it is to be observed in order to complete aristotle's theory on this subject that the four elements earth water air fire are all equally in a world which is contrary to nature that is the world of change of coming into being and going out of being apart from these there is the element of the eternal cosmos which is in accordance with nature having its own natural and eternal motion ever the same this is the fifth or divine element the ethereal 
by the schoolmen translated quinta essentia whence by a curious degradation we have our modern word quintessence of that which is the finest and subtlest extract still more clearly is the organic conception carried out in aristotle's discussion of the vital principle or soul in the various grades of living creatures and in man it will be sufficient to quote at length a chapter of aristotle's treatise on the subject de anima two page one in which this fundamental conception of aristotle's philosophy is very completely illustrated now as to substance we remark that this is one particular category among existences having three different aspects first there is so to say the raw material or matter having in it no definite character or quality next the form or specific character in virtue of which the thing becomes nameable and third there is the thing or substance which these two together constitute the matter is in other words the potentiality of the thing the form is the realization of that potentiality we may further have this realization in two ways corresponding in character to the distinction between knowledge which we have but are not necessarily using and actual contemplation or mental perception among substances as above defined those are most truly such which we call bodily objects and among these most especially objects which are the products of nature inasmuch as all other bodies must be derived from them now among such natural objects some are possessed of life some are not by life i mean a process of spontaneous nourishment growth and decay every natural object having life is a substance compounded so to say of several qualities it is in fact a bodily substance defined in virtue of its having life between the living body thus defined and the soul or vital principle a marked distinction must be drawn the body cannot be said to subsist in something else rather must we say that it is the matter or substratum in which something else subsists and what we mean by the soul is just this substance in the sense of the form or specific character that subsists in the natural body which is potentially living in other words the soul is substance as realization only however of such a body as has just been defined recalling now the distinction between realization as possessed knowledge and as actual contemplation we shall see that in its essential nature the soul or vital principle corresponds rather with the first than with the second for both sleep and waking depend on the soul or life being there but of these waking only can be said to correspond with the active form of knowledge sleep is rather to be compared with the state of having without being immediately conscious that we have now if we compare these two states in respect of their priority of development in a particular person we shall see that the state of latent possession comes first we may therefore define the soul or vital principle as the earliest realization entelechy of a natural body having in it the potentiality of life to every form of organic structure this definition applies for even the parts of plants are organs although very simple ones thus the outer leaf is a protection to the pericarp and the pericarp to the fruit or again the roots are organs bearing an analogy to the mouth in animals both serving to take in food putting our definition then into a form applicable to every stage of the vital principle we shall say that the soul is the earliest realization of a natural body having organization in this way we are relieved from the necessity of asking whether soul and body are one we might as well ask whether the wax and the impression are one or in short whether the matter of any object and that whereof it is the matter or substratum are one as has been pointed out unity and substantiality may have several significations but the truest sense of both is found in realization the general definition of the soul or vital principle above given may be further explained as follows the soul is the rational substance or function that is to say it is that which gives essential meaning and reality to a body as knowable thus if an axe were a natural instrument or organ its rational substance would be found in its realization of what an axe means this would be its soul apart from such realization it would not be an axe at all except in name being however such as it is the axe remains an axe independently of any such realization for the statement that the soul is the reason of a thing that which gives it essential meaning and reality does not apply to such objects as an axe but only to natural bodies having power of spontaneous motion including growth and rest or we may illustrate what has been said by reference to the bodily members if the eye be a living creature sight will be its soul for this is the rational substance or function of the eye on the other hand the eye itself is the material substance in which this function subsists which function being gone the eye would no longer be an eye except in name 
just as we can speak of the eye of a statue or of a painted form. Now apply this illustration from a part of the body to the whole. For as any one sense stands related to its organ, so does the vital sense in general to the whole sensitive organism as such, always remembering that we do not mean a dead body, but one which really has in it potential life, as the seed or fruit has. Of course there is a form of realization to which the name applies in a specially full sense, as when the axe is actually cutting, the eye actually seeing, the man fully awake. But the soul or vital principle corresponds rather with the function of sight, or the capacity for cutting which the axe has, the body on the other hand standing in a relation of potentiality to it. Now just as the eye may mean both the actual organ or pupil, and also the function of sight, so also the living creature means both the body and the soul. We cannot therefore think of body apart from soul, or soul apart from body. If, however, we regard the soul as composed of parts, we can see that the realization to which we give the name of soul is in some cases essentially a realization of certain parts of the body. We may, however, conceive the soul as in other aspects separable, insofar as the realization cannot be connected with any bodily parts. Nay, we cannot be certain whether the soul may not be the realization or perfection of the body as the sailor is of his boat. Observe that at the last Aristotle, though very tentatively, leaves an opening for immortality, where, as in the case of man, there are functions of the soul, such as philosophic contemplation, which cannot be related to bodily conditions. He really was convinced that in man there was a portion of that diviner ether which dwelt eternally in the heavens, and was the ever-moving cause of all things. If there was in man a passive mind, which became all things, as all things through sensation affected it, there was also, Aristotle argued, a creative mind in man, which is above and unmixed with that which it apprehends, gives laws to this, is essentially prior to all particular knowledge, is therefore eternal, not subject to the conditions of time and space, consequently indestructible. Finally, as a note on Aristotle's method, one may observe in this passage first Aristotle's use of defining examples, the wax, the leaf and fruit, the axe, the eye, etc. Second, his practice of developing his distinctions gradually, form and matter in the abstract, then in substances of every kind, then in natural bodies, then in organic bodies of various grades, in separate organs, in the body as a whole, and in the soul as separable in man. And thirdly, his method of approaching completeness in thought, by apparent contradictions or qualifications, which aim at meeting the complexity of nature by an equally organized complexity of analysis. To this let us simply add, by way of final characterization, that in the preceding pages we have given but the merest fragment here and there of Aristotle's vast accomplishment. So wide is the range of his ken, so minute his observation, so subtle and complicated and elusive his illustrations, that it is doubtful if any student of his, through all the centuries in which he has influenced the world, ever found life long enough to fairly and fully grasp him. Meanwhile he retains his grasp upon us. Form and matter, final and efficient causes, potential and actual existences, substance, accident, difference, genus, species, predication, syllogism, deduction, induction, analogy, and multitudes of other joints in the machinery of thought for all time, were forged for us in the workshop of Aristotle. End of section 20 Section 21 of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. The Skeptics and Epicureans. Philosophy, equally complete, equally perfect in all its parts, had its final word in Plato and Aristotle. On the great lines of universal knowledge, no further really original structures were destined to be raised by Greek hands. We have seen a parallelism between Greek philosophy and Greek politics in their earlier phases. The same parallelism continues to the end. Greece broke the bonds of her intense but narrow civic life and civic thought, and spread herself out over the world in a universal monarchy and a cosmopolitan philosophy. But with this widening of the area of her influence, reaction came and disruption and decay. An immense stimulus was given on the one hand to the political activity, on the other, to the thought and knowledge of the world as a whole. But at the centre Greece was living Greece no more. Her politics sank to the level of a dreary farce. Her philosophy died down to a dull and spiritless scepticism, to an epicureanism that seasoned the wine-cup with the dust of death, or to a stoicism not undignified yet still sad and narrow and stern. The hope of the world, alike in politics and in philosophy, faded as the life of Greece decayed.
the first phase of the change scepticism or pyrrhonism as it was named from its first teacher need not detain us long pyrrho was priest of elis in earlier life he accompanied alexander the great as far as india and is said to have become acquainted with certain of the philosophic sects in that country in his sceptical doctrine he had like his predecessors a school with its succession of teachers but the world has remembered little more of him or them than two phrases suspense of judgment this for the intellectual side of philosophy impassibility this for the moral the doctrine is a negation of doctrine the idle dream of idle men even pyrrho once when surprised in some sudden access of fear confessed that it was hard for him to get rid of the man in himself vigorous men and growing nations are never agnostic they decline to rest in mere suspense they are extremely the opposite of impassive they believe earnestly they feel strongly a more interesting because more positive and constructive personality was that of epicurus this philosopher was born at samos in the year 341 bc of athenian parents he came to athens in his eighteenth year xenocrates was then teaching at the academy aristotle at the lyceum but epicurus heard neither the one nor the other after some wanderings he returned to athens and set up on his own account as a teacher of philosophy he made it a matter of boasting that he was a self-taught philosopher and cicero de natura deorum one twenty six sarcastically remarks that one could have guessed as much even if epicurus had not stated it himself as one might of the proprietor of an ugly house who should boast that he had employed no architect the style of epicurus was in fact plain and unadorned but he seems all the same to have been able to say what he meant and few if any writers ancient or modern have ever had so splendid a literary tribute as epicurus had from the great roman poet lucretius his follower and expositor glory of the greek race he says who first hadst power to raise high so bright a light in the midst of darkness so profound shedding a beam on all the interests of life thee do i follow and in the markings of thy track do i set my footsteps now not that i desire to rival thee but rather for love of thee would fain call myself thy disciple for how shall the swallow rival the swan or what speed may the kid with its tottering limbs attain compared with the brave might of the scampering steed thou o father art the discoverer of nature thou suppliest to us a father's teachings and from thy pages illustrious one even as bees sip all manner of sweets along the flowery glades we in like manner devour all thy golden words golden and right worthy to live for ever for soon as thy philosophy birth of thy godlike mind hath begun to declare the origin of things straightway the terrors of the soul are scattered earth's walls are broken apart and through all the void i see nature in the working i behold the gods in manifestation of their power i discern their blissful seats which never winds assail nor rain clouds sprinkle with their showers nor snow falling white with hoary frost doth buffet but cloudless ether ever wraps them round beaming in broad diffusion of glorious light for nature supplies their every want nor aught impairs their peace of soul but nowhere do i see any regions of hellish darkness nor does the earth impose a barrier to our sight of what is done in the void beneath our feet whereof a holy ecstasy and thrill of awe possess me while thus by thy power the secrets of nature are disclosed to view lucretius de naturum rerum three one to thirty this devotion to the memory of epicurus on the part of lucretius was paralleled by the love felt for him by his contemporaries he had crowds of followers who loved him and who were proud to learn his words by heart he seems indeed to have been a man of exceptional kindness and amiability and the garden of epicurus became proverbial as a place of temperate pleasures and wise delights personally we may take it that epicurus was a man of simple tastes and moderate desires and indeed throughout its history epicureanism as a rule of conduct has generally been associated with the finer forms of enjoyment rather than the more sensual the sensual sty is a nickname not a description philosophy epicurus defined as a process of thought and reasoning tending to the realization of happiness arts or sciences which had no such practical end he condemned and as will be observed in lucretius's praises of him above even physics had but one purpose or interest to free the soul from terrors of the unseen thus philosophy was mainly concerned with conduct that is with ethics but secondarily and negatively with physics to which was appended what epicurus called canonics or the science of testing that is a kind of logic 
beginning with canonics as the first part of philosophy in order of time from the point of view of human knowledge epicurus laid it down that the only source of knowledge was the senses which gave us an immediate and true perception of that which actually came into contact with them even the visions of madmen or of dreamers he considered were in themselves true being produced by a physical cause of some kind of which these visions were the direct and immediate report falsity came in with people's interpretations or imaginations with respect to these sensations sensations leave a trace in the memory and out of similarities or analogies among sensations there are developed in the mind general notions or types such as man house which are also true because they are reproductions of sensations thirdly when a sensation occurs it is brought into relation in the mind with one or more of these types or notions this is predication true also in so far as its elements are true but capable of falsehood a subsequent or independent sensation may prove if supported or not contradicted by sensation it is or may be true if contradicted or not supported by sensation it is or may be false the importance of this statement of the canon of truth or falsehood will be understood when we come to the physics of epicurus at the basis of which is his theory of atoms which by their very nature can never be directly testified to by sensation this and no more was what epicurus had to teach on the subject of logic he had no theory of definition or division or ratiocination or refutation or explication on all these matters epicurus was as cicero said naked and unarmed like most self-taught or ill-taught teachers epicurus trusted to his dogmas he knew nothing and cared nothing for logical defence in his physics epicurus did little more than reproduce the doctrine of democritus he starts from the fundamental proposition that nothing can be produced from nothing nothing can really perish the veritable existences in nature are the atoms which are too minute to be discernible by the senses but which nevertheless have a definite size and cannot further be divided they have also a definite weight and form but no qualities other than these there is an infinity of empty space this epicurus proves on abstract grounds practically because a limit to space is unthinkable it follows that there must be an infinite number of the atoms otherwise they would disperse throughout the infinite void and disappear there is a limit however to the number of varieties among the atoms in respect of form size and weight the existence of the void space is proved by the fact that motion takes place to which he adds the argument that it necessarily exists also to separate the atoms one from another so far epicurus and democritus are agreed to the democritian doctrine however epicurus made a curious addition to which he himself is said to have attached much importance the natural course he said for all bodies having weight is downwards in a straight line it struck epicurus that this being so the atoms would all travel forever in parallel lines and those clashings and interminglings of atoms out of which he conceived all visible forms to be produced could never occur he therefore laid it down that the atoms deviated the least little bit from the straight thus making a world possible and epicurus considered that this supposed deviation of the atoms not only made a world possible but human freedom also in the deviation without apparent cause of the descending atoms the law of necessity was broken and there was room on the one hand for man's free will on the other for prayer to the gods and for hope of their interference on our behalf it may be worth while summarizing the proofs which lucretius in his great poem professedly following in the footsteps of epicurus adduces for these various doctrines epicurus's first dogma is nothing proceeds from nothing that is every material object has some matter previously existing exactly equal in quantity to it out of which it was made to prove this lucretius appeals to the order of nature as seen in the seasons in the phenomena of growth in the fixed relations which exist between life and its environment as regards what is helpful or harmful in the limitation of size and of faculties in the several species and the fixity of the characteristics generally in each in the possibilities of cultivation and improvement of species within certain limits and under certain conditions to prove his second position nothing passes into nothing lucretius points out to begin with that there is a law even in destruction force is required to dissolve or dismember anything were it otherwise the world would have disappeared long ago moreover he points out that it is from the elements set free by decay and death that new things are built up there is no waste no visible lessening of the resources of nature whether in the generations of living things in the flow of streams and the fullness of ocean or in the eternal stars were it not so infinite time past would have exhausted all the matter in the universe but nature is clearly immortal 
Moreover, there is a correspondence between the structure of bodies and the forces necessary to their destruction. Finally, apparent violations of the law, when carefully examined, only tend to confirm it. The rains no doubt disappear, but it is that their particles may reappear in the juices of the crops and the trees and the beasts which feed on them. Nor need we be surprised at the doctrine that the atoms, so all-powerful in the formation of things, are themselves invisible. The same is true of the forest-rending blasts, the viewless winds which lash the waves and overwhelm great fleets. There are odours also that float unseen upon the air. There are heat and cold and voices. There is the process of evaporation whereby we know that water has gone, yet cannot see its vapour departing. There is the gradual invisible detrition of rings upon the finger, of stones hollowed out by dripping water, of the ploughshare in the field, and the flags upon the streets, and the brazen statues of the gods whose fingers men kiss as they pass the gates, and the rocks that the salt sea brian eats into along the shore. That there is empty space or void he proves by all the varied motions on land and sea which we behold, by the porosity even of hardest things, as we see in dripping caves. There is the food also which disperses itself throughout the body, in trees and cattle. Voices pass through closed doors, frost can pierce even to the bones. Things equal in size vary in weight. A lump of wool has more of void in it than a lump of lead. So much for Lucretius. For abstract theories on physics, except as an adjunct and support to his moral conceptions, Epicurus seems to have had very little inclination. He thus speaks of the visible universe or cosmos. The cosmos is a sort of skyey enclosure which holds within it the stars, the earth, and all visible things. It is cut off from the infinite by a wall of division which may be either rare or dense, in motion or at rest, round or three-cornered or any other form. That there is such a wall of division is quite admissible, for no object of which we have observation is without its limit. Were this wall of division to break, everything contained within it would tumble out. We may conceive that there are an infinite number of such cosmic systems with intercosmic intervals throughout the infinity of space. He is very disinclined to assume that similar phenomena, for example eclipses of the sun or moon, always have the same cause. The various accidental implications and interminglings of the atoms may produce the same effect in various ways. In fact, Epicurus has the same impatience of theoretical physics as of theoretical philosophy. He is a practical man. He is getting nearer his object when he comes to the nature of the soul. The soul, like everything else, is composed of atoms, extremely delicate and fine. It very much resembles the breath, with a mixture of heat thrown in, sometimes coming nearer in nature to the first, sometimes to the second. Owing to the delicacy of its composition, it is extremely subject to variation, as we see in its passions and liability to emotion, its phases of thought and the varied experiences without which we cannot live. It is, moreover, the chief cause of sensation being possible for us, not that it could of itself have had sensation, without the enwrapping support of the rest of the structure. The rest of the structure, in fact, having prepared this chief cause, gets from it a share of what comes to it, but not a share of all which the soul has. The soul, being of material composition, equally with the other portions of the bodily structure, dies of course with it, that is, its particles like the rest are dispersed, to form new bodies. There is nothing dreadful, therefore, about death, for there is nothing left to know or feel anything about it. As regards the process of sensation, Epicurus, like Democritus, conceived bodies as having a power of emitting from their surface extremely delicate images of themselves. These are composed of very fine atoms, but in spite of their tenuity, they are able to maintain for a considerable time their relative form and order, though liable after a time to distortion. They fly with great celerity through the void, and find their way through the windows of the senses to the soul, which by its delicacy of nature is in sympathy with them, and apprehends their form. The gods are indestructible, being composed of the very finest and subtlest atoms, so as to have not a body, but as it were a body. Their life is one of perfect blessedness and peace. They are in number countless, but the conceptions of the vulgar are erroneous respecting them. They are not subject to the passions of humanity. Anger and joy are alike alien to their nature, for all such feelings imply a lack of strength. They dwell apart in the intercosmic spaces. As Cicero jestingly remarks, Epicurus, by way of a joke, introduced his gods so pure that you could see through them, so delicate that the wind could blow through them, having their dwelling place outside between two worlds for fear of breakage. 
coming finally to epicurus's theory of ethics we find a general resemblance to the doctrine of democritus and aristippus the end of life is pleasure or the absence of pain he differs however from the cyrenaics in maintaining that not the pleasure of the moment is the end but pleasure throughout the whole of life and that therefore we ought in our conduct to have regard to the future further he denies that pleasure exists only in activity it exists equally in rest and quiet in short he places more emphasis in his definition on the absence of pain or disturbance than on the presence of positive pleasure and thirdly while the cyrenaics maintained that bodily pleasures and pains were the keenest epicurus claimed these characteristics for the pleasures of the mind which intensified the present feeling by anticipations of the future and recollections of the past and thus the wise man might be happy even on the rack better indeed was it to be unlucky and wise than lucky and foolish in a similar temper epicurus on his deathbed wrote thus to a friend in the enjoyment of blessedness and peace on this the last day of my life i write this letter to you strangury has supervened and the extremest agony of internal pains yet resisting these has been my joy of soul as i recalled the thoughts which i have had in the past we must note however that while mental pleasures counted for much with the epicureans these mental pleasures consisted not in thought for thought's sake in any form they had nothing to do with contemplation they were essentially connected with bodily experiences they were the memory of past the anticipation of future bodily pleasures for it is to be remembered that thoughts were with epicurus only converted sensations and sensations were bodily processes thus every joy of the mind was conditioned by a bodily experience preceding it or as metrodorus epicurus's disciple defined the matter a man is happy when his body is in good case and he has good hope that it will continue so directly or indirectly therefore every happiness came back in the rough phrase of epicurus to one's belly at last this theory did not however reduce morality to bestial self-indulgence if profligate pleasures could be had free from mental apprehensions of another world and of death and pain and disease in this and if they brought with them guidance as to their own proper restriction there would be no reason whatever to blame a man for filling himself to the full of pleasures which brought no pain or sorrow that is no evil in their train but epicurus argues this is far from being the case moreover there are many pleasures keen enough at the time which are by no means pleasant in the remembering and even when we have them they bring no enjoyment to the highest parts of our nature what those highest parts are and by what standard their relative importance is determined epicurus does not say he probably meant those parts of our nature which had the widest range in space and time our faculties namely of memory and hope of conception of sight and hearing moreover there are distinctions among desires some are both natural and compulsory such as thirst some are natural but not compulsory as the desire for dainties some are neither natural nor compulsory such as the desire for crowns or statues the last of these the wise man will condemn the second he will admit but so as to retain his freedom for independence of such things is desirable not necessarily that we may reduce our wants to a minimum but in order that if we cannot enjoy many things we may be content with few for i am convinced epicurus continues that they have the greatest enjoyment of wealth who are least dependent upon it for enjoyment thus if epicurus did not absolutely teach simplicity of living he taught his disciples the necessity of being capable of such simplicity which they could hardly be without practice so that in reality the doctrine of epicurus came very near that of his opponents as seneca the stoic observed pleasure with him comes to be something very thin and pale in fact that law which we declare for virtue the same law he lays down for pleasure one of the chief and highest pleasures of life epicurus found in the possession of friends who provided for each other not only help and protection but a lifelong joy for the larger friendship of the civic community epicurus seems to have had only a very neutral regard justice he says is a convention of interests with a view of neither hurting or being hurt the wise man will have nothing to do with politics if he can help it in spite of much that may offend in the doctrines of epicurus there is much at least in the man which is sympathetic and attractive what one observes however when we compare such a philosophy with that of plato or aristotle is first a total loss of constructive imagination the parts of the philosophy if we are so to call it of epicurus hang badly together and neither the canonics nor the physics show any real faculty of serious thinking at all the ethics has a wider scope and a more real relation to experience if not to reason 
but it can never satisfy the deeper apprehension of mankind the truest and most permanently valid revelations of life come not to the many but to the one or the few who communicate the truth to the many sometimes at the cost of their own lives always at the cost of antagonism and ridicule a philosophy therefore which only represents in theoretical form the average practice of the average man comes into the world still born it has nothing to say its hearers know it all and the exact value of it all already and in their heart of hearts many even of those who have stooped to a lower ideal and sold their birthright of hopes beyond the passing hour for a mess of pottage in the form of material success and easy enjoyment have a lurking contempt for the preachers of what they practice as many a slaveholder in america probably had for the clerical defenders of the divine institution there is a wasting sense of inadequacy in this hand-to-mouth theory of living which compels most of those who follow it to tread softly and speak moderately they are generally a little weary if not cynical they don't think much of themselves or of their success but they prefer to hold on as they have begun rather than launch out into new courses which they feel they have not the moral force to continue may i die said the cynic rather than lead a life of pleasure may i die says the epicurean rather than make a fool of myself the idealist is to them if not a hypocrite at least a visionary if not a tartuffe at least a don quixote tilting at windmills yet even for poor don quixote with all his blindness and his follies the world retains a sneaking admiration it can spare a few or a good many of its worldly wisdoms rather than lose altogether its enthusiasms and its dreams and the one thing which saves epicureanism from utter extinction as the theory is invariably the idealism which like a purple patch adorns it here and there no man and no theory is wholly self-centered pleasure is supplanted by utility and utility becomes the greatest happiness of the greatest number and so as horace says epistles one ten twenty four naturam expellas furca tamen usque recurret nature like love thrust out of the door will come back by the window and the idealism which is not allowed to make pain a pleasure is required at last to translate pleasure into pains end of section twenty one Section 22 of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. The Stoics. Zeno, the founder of the Stoic school of philosophy, born Kirk of 340 BC, was a native of Citium in Cyprus. The city was Greek, but with a large Phoenician admixture. And it is curious that in this last and sternest phase of Greek thought, not the founder only, but a large proportion of the successive leaders of the school came from this and other places having Semitic elements in them. Among these places notable as nurseries of Stoicism was Tarsus in Cilicia, the birthplace of St. Paul. The times of preparation were drawing to a close, and through these men, with their eastern intensity and capacities of self-searching and self-abasement, the philosophy of Greece was linking itself on to the wisdom of the Hebrews. Zeno came to Athens to study philosophy, and for twenty years he was a pupil first of Crates the Cynic, and then of other teachers. At length he set up a school of his own in the celebrated Stoa Poecile, painted colonnade, so named because it was adorned with frescoes by Polygnotus. There he taught for nearly sixty years, and voluntarily ended his life when close on a century old. His life, as Antigonus, king of Macedon, recorded on his tomb, was consistent with his doctrine abstemious frugal laborious dutiful he was succeeded by cleanthes a native of assos in asia minor but the great constructor of the stoic doctrine without whom as his contemporaries said there had been no stoic school at all was chrysippus a native of soli or of tarsus in cilicia he wrote at enormous length supporting his teachings by an immense erudition and culling liberally from the poets to illustrate and enforce his views learned and pedantic his works had no inherent attraction, and nothing of them but fragments has been preserved. We know the Stoic doctrine mainly from the testimony and criticisms of later times. Like the Epicureans, Zeno and his successors made philosophy primarily a search for the chief good, the doctrine of practice and morals. But like them, they were impelled to admit a logic and a physics, at least by way of preliminary basis to their ethics. The relations of the three they illustrated by various images, Philosophy was like an animal. Logic was its bones and sinews, ethics its flesh, physics its life or soul. Or again, philosophy was an egg, 
logic was the shell, ethics the white, physics the yoke. Or again it was a fruitful field, logic was the hedge, ethics the crop, physics the soil. Or it was a city, well ordered and strongly fortified, and so on. The images seem somewhat confused, but the general idea is clear enough. Morality was the essential, the living body of philosophy. Physics supplied its raw material, or the conditions under which a moral life could be lived. Logic secured that we should use that material rightly and wisely for the end desired. Logic the Stoics divided into two parts. Rhetoric, the science of the open hand, and dialectic, the science of the closed fist, as Zeno called them. They indulged in elaborate divisions and subdivisions of each, with which we need not meddle. The only points of interest to us are contained in their analysis of the processes of perception and thought. A sensation, Zeno taught, was the result of an external impulse, which, when combined with an internal assent, produced a mental state that revealed at the same time itself and the external object producing it. The perception thus produced he compared to the grip which the hand took of a solid object, and real perceptions those, that is, that were caused by a real external object, and not by some illusion, always testified to the reality of their cause by this sensation of grip. The internal assent of the mind was voluntary and at the same time necessary, for the mind could not do otherwise than will the acceptance of that which it was fitted to receive. The peculiarity of their physics, which we shall have to refer to later on, namely the denial of the existence of anything not material, implied that in some way there was a material action of the external object on the structure of the perceiving mind, itself also material. What exactly the nature of this action was, the Stoics themselves were not quite agreed. The idea of an impression such as a seal makes upon wax was a tempting one, but they had difficulty in comprehending how there could be a multitude of different impressions on the same spot without effacing each other. Some therefore preferred the vaguer and safer expression, modification. Had they possessed our modern science, they might have illustrated their meaning by reference to the phenomena of magnetism or electricity. An interesting passage may be quoted from Plutarch on the Stoic doctrine of knowledge. The Stoics maintain, he says, that when a human being is born, he has the governing part of his soul like a sheet of paper ready prepared for the reception of writing, and on this the soul inscribes in succession its various ideas. The first form of the writing is produced through the senses. When we perceive, for example, a white object, the recollection remains when the object is gone. And when many similar recollections have accumulated, we have what is called experience. Besides the ideas which we get in this natural and quite undesigned way, there are other ideas which we get through teaching and information. In the strict sense, only these latter ought to be called ideas. The former should rather be called perceptions. Now the rational faculty in virtue of which we are called reasoning beings, is developed out of, or over and beyond, the mass of perceptions in the second seven years' period of life. In fact, a thought may be defined as a kind of mental image, such as a rational animal alone is capable of having. Thus there are various gradations of mental apprehensions. First, those of sensible qualities obtained through the action of the objects and the ascent of the perceiving subject, as already described. Then by experience, by comparison, by analogy, by the combinations of the reasoning faculty, further and more general notions are arrived at, and conclusions formed, as, for example, that the gods exist and exercise a providential care over the world. By this faculty also the wise man ascends to the apprehension of the good and true. The physics of the Stoics started from the fundamental proposition that in the universe of things there were two elements, the active and the passive. The latter was matter or unqualified existence. The former was the reason or qualifying element in matter, that is, God, who, being eternal, is the fashioner of every individual thing throughout the universe of matter. God is one. He is reason and fate and Zeus. In fact, all the gods are only various representations of his faculties and powers. He, being from the beginning of things by himself, turneth all existence through air to water. And even as the genital seed is enclosed in the semen, so also was the seed of the world concealed in the water, making its matter apt for the further birth of things. Then first it brought into being the four elements, fire, water, air, earth. For there was a finer fire or air which was the moving spirit of things. Later and lower than this were the material elements of fire and air. It follows that the universe of things is threefold. There is first God himself, the source of all character and individuality, who is indestructible and eternal, the fashioner of all things, 
who in certain cycles of ages gathers up all things into himself, and then out of himself brings them again to birth. There is the matter of the universe whereon God works, and thirdly there is the union of the two. Thus the world is governed by reason and forethought, and this reason extends through every part, even as the soul or life extends to every part of us. The universe therefore is a living thing, having a soul or reason in it. This soul or reason one teacher likened to the air, another to the sky, another to the sun. For the soul of nature is, as it were, a finer air or fire, having a power of creation in it, and moving in an ordered way to the production of things. The universe is one and of limited extension, being spherical in form, for this is the form which best adapts itself to movement. Outside this universe is infinite bodiless space, but within the universe there is no empty part, all is continuous and united, as is proved by the harmony of relation which exists between the heavenly bodies and those upon the earth. The world as such is destructible, for its parts are subject to change and to decay. Yet is this change or destruction only in respect of the qualities imposed upon it from time to time by the reason inherent in it. The mere unqualified matter remains indestructible. In the universe evil of necessity exists, for evil being the opposite of good, where no evil is, there no good can be. For just as in a comedy there are absurdities, which are in themselves bad, but yet add a certain attraction to the poem as a whole, so also one may blame evil regarded in itself, yet for the whole it is not without its use. So also God is the cause of death equally with birth, for even as cities when the inhabitants have multiplied over much, remove their superfluous members by colonization or by war, so also is God a cause of destruction. In man in like manner good cannot exist save with evil. For wisdom being a knowledge of good and evil, remove the evil and wisdom itself goes. Disease and other natural evils, when looked at in the light of their effects, are means not of evil but of good. There is throughout the universe a balance and interrelation of good and evil. Not that God hath in himself any evil. The law is not the cause of lawlessness, nor God himself responsible for any violation of right. The Stoics indulged in a strange fancy that the world reverted after a mighty cycle of years in all its parts to the same form and structure which it possessed at the beginning, so that there would be once more a Socrates, a Plato, and all the men that had lived, each with the same friends and fellow citizens, the same experiences, and the same endeavours. At the termination of each cycle there was a burning up of all things, and thereafter a renewal of the great round of life. Nothing incorporeal, they maintained, can be affected by or affect that which is corporeal. Body alone can affect body. The soul, therefore, must be corporeal. Death is the separation of soul from body, but it is impossible to separate what is incorporeal from body. Therefore, again, the soul must be corporeal. In the belief of Cleanthes, the souls of all creatures remained to the next period of cyclic conflagration. Chrysippus believed that only the souls of the wise and good remained. Coming finally to the ethics of the Stoic philosophy, we find for the chief end of life this definition, a life consistent with itself, or as it was otherwise expressed, a life consistent with nature. The two definitions are really identical, for the law of nature is the law of our nature, and the reason in our being the reason which also is in God, the supreme ruler of the universe. This is substantially in accordance with the celebrated law of right action laid down by Kant, Act so that the maxim of thine action be capable of being made a law of universal action. Whether a man act thus or no, by evil if not by good the eternal law will satisfy itself. The question is of import only for the man's own happiness. Let his will accord with the universal will, then the law will be fulfilled, and the man will be happy. Let his will resist the universal will, then the law will be fulfilled, but the man will bear the penalty. This was expressed by Cleanthes in a hymn which ran somewhat thus. Lead me, O Zeus, most great, and thou eternal fate, what way soe'er thy will doth bid me travel, that way I'll follow without fret or cavil. Or if I evil be, and spurn thy high decree, even so I still shall follow, soon or late. Thus in the will alone consists the difference of good or ill for us. In either case nature's great law fulfills itself infallibly. To their view on this point we may apply the words of Hamlet. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. 
this universal law expresses itself in us in various successive manifestations from the moment of birth it implants in us a supreme self-affection whereby of infallible instinct we seek our own self-preservation rejoice in that which is suitable to our existence shrink from that which is unsuitable as we grow older further and higher principles manifest themselves reason and reflection a more and more careful and complete apprehension of that which is honourable and advantageous a capacity of choice among goods till finally the surpassing glory of that which is just and honourable shines out so clear upon us that any pain or loss is esteemed of no account if only we may attain to that thus at last by the very law of our being we come to know that nothing is truly and absolutely good but goodness nothing absolutely bad but sin other things inasmuch as they have no character of moral good or moral evil cannot be deemed really good or bad in comparison with the absolutely good they are things indifferent though in comparison with each other they may be relatively preferable or relatively undesirable even pleasure and pain so far as concerns the absolute end or happiness of our being are things indifferent we cannot call them either good or evil yet have they a relation to the higher law for the consciousness of them was so implanted in us at the first that our souls by natural impulse are drawn to pleasure while they shrink from pain as from a deadly enemy wherefore reason neither can nor ought to seek wholly to eradicate these primitive and deep-seated affections of our nature but so to exercise a resisting and ordering influence upon them as to render them obedient and subservient to herself that which is absolutely good wisdom righteousness courage temperance does good only and never ill to us all other things life health pleasure beauty strength wealth reputation birth and their opposites death disease pain deformity weakness poverty contempt humility of station these are in themselves neither a benefit nor a curse they may do us good they may do us harm we may use them for good we may use them for evil thus the stoics worked out on ideal and absolute lines the thought of righteousness as the chief and only good across this ideal picture were continually being drawn by opponents without or inquirers within clouds of difficulty drawn from real experience what it was asked of progress in goodness is this a middle state between good and evil or if a middle state between good and evil be a contradiction in terms how may we characterize it here the wiser teachers had to be content to answer that it tended towards good was good in possibility would be absolutely good when the full attainment came and the straining after right had been swallowed up in the perfect calm of settled virtue how also of the wise man tormented by pain or in hunger and poverty and rags is his perfectness of wisdom and goodness really sufficient to make him happy here again the answer had to be hesitating and provisional through no fault of the stoics in this world while we are still under the strange dominion of time and circumstance the ideal can never wholly fit the real there must still be difficulty and incompleteness here only to be solved and perfected when iniquity shall have an end our eyes may fail with looking upward yet the upward look is well and the jibes upon the stoic king in rags that horace and others were so fond of does not affect the question it may have been and probably often was the case that stoic teachers were apt to transfer to themselves personally the ideal attributes which they justly assigned to the ideal man in whom wisdom was perfected the doctrine gave much scope for cant and mental pride and hypocrisy as every ideal doctrine does including the christian but the existence of these vices in individuals no more affected the doctrine of an ideal goodness in its stoic form than it does now in its christian one that only the good man is truly wise or free or happy that vice however lavishly it surround itself with luxury and ease and power is inherently wretched and foolish and slavish these are things which are worth saying and worth believing things indeed which the world dare not and cannot permanently disbelieve however difficult or even impossible it may be to mark men off into two classes the good and the bad however strange the irony of circumstance which so often shows the wicked who are not troubled as other men neither are they plagued like other men they have more than their heart could wish while good men battle with adversity often in vain still will the permanent fruitful progressive faith of man look to the end still will the ideal be powerful to plead for the painful right and spoil even in the tasting the pleasant wrong the doctrine of course like every doctrine worth anything was pushed to extravagant lengths and thrust into inappropriate quarters by foolish doctrinaires 
as that the wise man is the only orator critic poet physician nay cobbler if you please that the wise man knows all that is to be known and can do everything that is worth doing and so on the school was often too academic too abstract too fond of hearing itself talk this alas is what most schools are and most schoolmasters yet the stoics were not altogether alien to the ordinary interests and duties of life they admitted a duty of cooperating in politics at least in such states as showed some desire for or approach to virtue they approved of the wise man taking part in education of his marrying and bringing up children both for his own sake and his country's he will be ready even to withdraw himself from life on behalf of his country or his friends this withdrawal which was their word for suicide came unhappily to be much in the mouths of later and especially of the roman stoics who in the sadness and restraint of prevailing despotism came to thank god that no one was compelled to remain in life he might withdraw when the burden of life the hopelessness of useful activity became too great with this sad stern yet not undignified note the philosophy of greece speaks its last word the later scepticism of the new academy directed mainly to a negative criticism of the crude enough logic of the stoics or of the extravagances of their ethical doctrine contributed no substantial element to thought or morals as an eclectic system it had much vogue side by side with stoicism and epicureanism among the romans having as its chief exponent cicero as epicureanism had lucretius and stoicism seneca the common characteristic of all these systems in their later development is their cosmopolitanism homo sum il humania me alienum puto i am a man nothing appertaining to humanity do i deem alien from myself this was the true keynote of whatever was vital in any of them and the reason of this is not far to seek we have seen already how the chaos of sophistic doctrine was largely conditioned if not produced by the breakdown of the old civic life of greece the process hardly suffered delay from all the efforts of socrates and plato cosmopolitanism was already a point of union between the cynics and the cyrenaics and the march of politics was always tending in the same direction first through great leagues such as the spartan or athenian or theban each with a predominant or tyrannical city at the head then later through the conquest of greece by alexander and the leaguing of all greek speaking peoples in the great invasion of asia then through the spread of greek letters all over the eastern world and the influx upon greek centres such as athens and alexandria of all manner of foreign intelligences and finally through the conquest of all this teeming world of culture by the discipline and practical ability of rome and its incorporation in a universal empire of law all the barriers which had divided city from city and tribe from tribe and race from race disappeared and only a common humanity remained the only effective philosophies for such a community were those which regarded man as an individual with a world politically omnipotent hedging him about and driving him in upon himself thus the new academy enlarged on the doubtfulness of all beyond the individual consciousness stoicism insisted on individual dutifulness epicureanism on individual self-satisfaction the first sought to make life worth living through culture the second through indifference the third through a moderate enjoyment but all alike felt themselves very helpless in face of the growing sadness of life in face of the deepening mystery of the world beyond all alike were controversial and quick enough to ridicule their rivals none was hopefully constructive or unless in the poetic enthusiasm of a lucretius very confident of the adequacy of its own conceptions they all rather quickened the sense of emptiness in human existence than satisfied it at the best they enabled men to absent themselves a little while from the felicity of death thus all over the wide area of greek and roman civilization the activity of the later schools was effectual to familiarize humanity with the language of philosophy and to convince humanity of the inadequacy of its results both of these things the greeks taught to saul of tarsus at a higher source he found the satisfying of his soul but from the greek philosophies he learned the language through which the new revelation was to be taught in the great world of roman rule and grecian culture and thus through the pauline theology greek philosophy had its part in the moral regeneration of the world as it has had in later times in every emancipation and renaissance of its thought end of section 22 End of A Short History of Greek Philosophy by John Marshall